Testing, testing. One, two, one, two, three, four. This is me just talking. Hello and welcome. Let's uh, do some cable management over here. Get going down that way and around, sneaking in and voila.
Good morning. Hey, Brad. How's it going? Um, I guess this is sort of my tech check here. See how it all goes. See what goes wrong. Maybe play some games. Maybe edit some video. We'll see how this works. Uh, I theoretically have someone coming in to join and bounce off of me for a while. But, uh, yeah. So here we go. Um, who am I and why am I doing this? Well... My name is Al Toms, as you can see from the channel title, and I do photography, like what you see on my uh, web browser here, and uh, that's for fun. That's my creative, for fun sort of stuff. Um, but what I actually do is I work in live broadcast. We show up to locations. We, well, pre-COVID, we showed up to locations with anywhere from three to seven cameras, and we would edit everything. Oh, thank you, Brad. Audio is good. I hope it is. Um, and we edit live the event. And uh, ever since COVID, we've really expanded into the live broadcasting side of it. Before, we used to mainly just do a hardware switch, get the cameras in there, bring it home, fix anything that we wanted to fix about the production, and then uh, send it back to client for them to put on their websites for sale and uh, for their subscribers, for their clients, uh, or make marketing materials for them. Um, that's actually me steady camming that shot right, right there. That was TEDx in Vancouver here. Um, and yeah, so, and then I've got a few film credits to my name, mostly, uh, you know, Galala was an assistant editor role. After Hours, I DP'd that for the first episode or two. Uh, we did Wild Rockies. It, uh, it used to be called Wild Mountain Rockies, but I guess the name got changed on us there. That was hell on wheels. We rode in a Toyota, a uh, little Tacoma, uh, 90 some odd two door, 20 hours a day, driving all over BC and Alberta, through the Rocky Mountains, through treacherous territory, right up with grizzly bears, elk, caribou. Um, I think we saw a wolverine or two in there. Cinema cameras, it was a Sony F55 that we were using with PL glass, and uh, I tell you, that, 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 was a, that was a whole trip. I can go into that one. Um, and then Stolen Path, this was actually one, they had filmed it in Croatia. The, exec, the, the executive got a little bit uh, waylaid a little bit by a film crew, and they were convinced to go all the way to Croatia to film this, this love story. It's sort of their... Romeo and Juliet sort of thing and the footage they got back was just terrible like uh, no attention to set deck there's glass in window there's glass in photo frames that were around in the 1700s like th that, did, that wasn't a thing um, you could see the light in the glass reflection everything was underlit gray washed out and they had a red app I think they were using like a red epic with ef glass and they had a three-point light kit and expected to do a feature we were brought in on a budget to try and make the best of it and we ended up getting some really high quality stuff we had uh, clayton richard long rest his soul um he was our camera operator and dp and we had john banovich directing and sort of liaising with the executive and convincing them that we needed the budget to do x y or z and I was the gaffer for that one. We had a few, we had a thrown together kit, mostly just our own kits that we had, a bunch of LOL kits and some redheads. And uh, we did rent like an 18K or a 12K HMI at some point, but uh, it was very much, it was indie film style, but we came up with a really great thing. We ended up reshooting maybe 70% of the whole thing. So uh, this is sort of what I do as I do lighting, I do used to do a lot of short films. I used to do, uh, but light, light is my muse. And uh, ever since working the TV industry for a bit, I worked low level TV industry here in Vancouver. Um, I started realizing that my priorities were to be with my family. So I joined up with uh, Leaders Media. <laughs> yeah, redheads. I'll, I'll keep my comments to myself about that one. <laughs> uh, good morning, Tyler. Um, and so, uh, mostly these days I just do the very boring, all of our work colleagues call us boring shooters. We 
set up the cameras. Everything is center frame by center frame, proper exposure, no shallow bokeh, no nothing. Just as clear as day, as steady as day, and keep up to that darn speaker who's going to stand in one spot for five minutes and then cross the stage in less than five seconds. Um, just keeping up to those people, making their lives easy, making our lives as easy as possible, and just getting a bulletproof solid result for live production. And that's what I do these days. <laughs> yeah, I don't really use my uh, Twitch anymore. I, I'm just going to try and focus all my attention onto what, one platform and see what happens. Uh, and let's see if the algorithm helps me out at all or if it just screws me over. I have no idea. But uh, we can try. <laughs> um, oh, there we go. Someone. Okay, we might have a guest coming in soon. Uh, we'll figure that out. Um, but yeah, anyway, so I've got Tyler, I've got Brad here. Um, we can go any direction today. This is mostly a test. Would you guys like to uh, do more of a video production sort of standpoint? Uh, go through some live production prints. Actually, my live production has been occupied by doing this. But go through some video editing sort of principles, maybe crack open a project, do some gaming, or just... I can bring some of you guys on and we can chat through just the general process of making videos or photos and your guys' experience as well. I'm happy to bring any and all of you guys on as guests. <laughs> yeah, the uh, there was a, there's a college that we uh, filmed for. They were one of their educators is getting quite elderly. And they wanted to capture all of her good material because she sort of founded the college. And uh, so we were being brought in to record these so that they could sell them uh, later and so that she wouldn't have to travel so much because she would travel all over the world. It was a mobile college, basically. And I tell you, she would do this. She was an old lady and her hands would be moving away and she'd kind of do this back and forth swaying all the time. So you couldn't be too tight. Otherwise, your camera's going back and forth and giving everyone confusions. Um, and then she'd all of a sudden cross the room on an inspiration and go and grab something from the wall that she'd pinned there earlier and then bring it back in. And then she'd always do these false starts to get going. And then she wouldn't actually follow through on uh, on the movement. So it was always a game of chicken with her. <laughs> always, always. <laughs> but uh, most of the time, you know, when you're doing TEDx's, they stay in one spot typically. When you're doing... A lot of corporate events, they don't have the creativity to cross the stage all the time. So they often stay in like a small circle. But it's the ones who are trying to teach, the ones who are speakers by trade, you know, the Tony Robbins, the, uh, um, we've done, uh, what? what's the frick, the guy's name, did Chicken Soup for the Soul. We filmed him one time, uh, Colin Sprake from Business Excellence, uh, Make Your Mark. He loves walking everywhere, like just... Yeah, you, you never know what you're getting into until you see how they sort of start acting. But finding cap camera operators that can last that long is a bit difficult. Um, let's check in with this fella here. Okay, just checking in with uh, someone who might patch in here. I'll get a link ready for them anyways. Let's go and add an input. We'll do a, vi a video call, but we're not going to do video. Um, they're going to get output one. Might as well give them good Bandwidth, give them bus A for their audio. Hey, Darcy. How's it going?
Okay, well, we'll see if he patches in or not. Um, in the meantime, um, what does everyone feel like today? Do we feel like doing some uh, video editing? I've got an ancient project that is absolutely terrible that we can tear apart and uh, reconstruct. We've got some gaming that I can do. Um, if my guest comes on, we can probably do some gaming as a group, or I can bring one of you guys on and we can have some fun. Uh, really, this is mostly just a relaxed, chill sesh. I should actually get some music going again. That's... Fill the silence. I don't know. I can do a whole bunch of them. Let me, uh, I've got a Steam library full. We've got narrative games like The Witcher. We've got, uh, co-ops, or we got versus games. There's actually an excellent game called, uh, um, uh, totally accurate battle simulator it's a ragdoll simulator where you it's it's a very drunken game you have a shot every time you lose sort of tone um let's see let's take a look at my steam library let's go um steam library okay yeah yeah we can definitely do that Actually, let me see if I can transfer that to a local drive here. Let's see. Yeah, I've got uh, Northgard, which is kind of fun. It's a strategy Viking real-time game. We got Outer Wilds. That is just a special game. Um, problem is, you can only ever play it once. Okay, yeah, so editing might be a good idea. I see the chat coming in here. Okay, yeah, let's open up an ancient project of mine. Um, do not judge the camera work, but uh, let's go ahead and open that up. very very special um i would say it's more of a philosophical game than anything else like you think you're on the route for doing one thing and then you find out it's another thing and by the end of it you've done a whole emotional journey um only problem is it's super spoiler sensitive so you have to either commit to playing it yourself and ignoring everyone else on the internet or just play or just watch it and give up on playing it Hey, good morning, uh, records. How you doing? Where did that go? Ah, here it is. Okay, so yeah, I guess let's do, uh... Let's do a bit of video editing then. So, here we go. This is my project file, exactly as I left it. It is an absolute mess, so first step for me is always jumping in here and just figuring out what is what in here. So we've got, looks like some exports, and this was done in, uh, in Grass Valley, uh, Canopus uh, ADS 2.5, I believe. So all these .ewc2s are the render files from there, the preview files. So we're going to clean this up a little bit. So we want to have an exports folder. And let's just clean that into there. This is often what I do when I get a project from another crew that they really kind of bunged up. Sometimes I'm brought in to try and fix stuff up and clean up the projects. And uh, this is always my first step, is just to go in here and see what's going on. Okay, this is some sort of BTS. Okay. We don't need to worry about that right now. 
Um, exports are there. Footage. Let's see what we got. We got some music. Okay. And we've got a new folder. That is CR2 file, so I think that's images. Yeah, it's behind the scenes images by the looks of it. Okay, and that doesn't look like it's relevant. Uh, let's switch this view to uh, thumbnails. Maybe large ones. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is all really, really orange. Oh goodness. I do not know why I had that so orange. Did I not know how to color correct at the, or color balance at the time? <laughs> yeah, VLC, it is amazing. You can stream from it, you can... I think you can kind of edit from it, but you can definitely stream from it, you can do servers. Um, I've used it in multiple ways, and as a very last line of defense too, actually, because uh, sometimes uh, Adobe gets cranky and doesn't like a certain file codec, and it just won't open it. And then you throw it into Handbrake, and that won't do it either. It just gives you a, uh, an empty file with a codec wrapped around it. And so uh, what I'll sometimes do is I'll throw it into VLC, and I'll just export it out from there, and somehow... That's my Hail Mary. If that doesn't work, I don't know what to do, but I'll sometimes fix it. <laughs> oh, thanks. I'm told I have a voice and a face for radio, so I'll just keep my face off of radio for now. Um, okay, so we got that. I think these are all... What is this? I don't even know if that's related. Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to just load this all into a Premiere project and we will take it from there. Okay, so let's boot up a bit of Premiere. <laughs> yeah, heck, actually one thing we could do, we could turn this all black and white. Just get rid of the color altogether and then we don't worry about uh, saturation or the skin tones. load this all in right into Premiere. Um, Brad, yeah, you, you could, and actually I'll show you how we can do that. Um, actually, I'll open up Resolve for that. Resolve is a good one to demonstrate this with. The problem is, this was recorded on, if I remember correctly, a uh, Canon Rebel T4i, which has a 420 compression on it, and there's only like a 1080 <clears throat> image in the first place. So everything combined there, it's a paper-thin codec. We can do some minor adjustments, but as soon as we start taking it too far, you're going to see the image will actually literally break down in front of us. So for instance, 
Um, if I take... Let's take a normal looking shot here. Uh, yeah, change the frame rate. <laughs> yeah, Resolve, it's a good software. I really like it. Um, it doesn't do everything we need it to do professionally, but that's because we don't just edit TV shows and film. We do more of a live production thing. So if we go here, okay, that's an out of focus shot, but it's mostly balanced. This here is a terrible shot all around. Um, and what we're looking at here, let me go over to my edit page here. What we're looking at is, you see how compressed his skin is there? Actually, can I move the frame around at all? No, it doesn't seem like that. There we are. There we go. So if you look at his skin tones here, first of all, you say, what skin tones? I see magenta, I see yellow. There's a little bit of white, but that's because of a luminance, not because of a saturation. Um, so Darcy, in uh, video production, so when you take a photo, you can take a, a JPEG, which is your compressed. You can take a, a raw of your favorite brand's flavor and you can take a tiff if you want uh, tiff is typically an export from photoshop or something like that same with png and whatnot so let's just use raw and jpeg jpeg if you take a jpeg it's super compressed it's everything that you saw in your viewfinder uh, if you're using mirrorless at least and then anything that you don't see on the back of your camera is thrown away just gone uh, you, so it gives you a bit you have a bit of flexibility you can kind of use some latent information but there's not much um, for raw photos that's where you can do like this you know your sky is blown out but you pull it back in and get to see that blue with the fluffy clouds and all that stuff so that's an oversimplified sort of example but in video we've got it far more complicated so it's not just raw or compressed it's raw what kind of raw what kind of compressed so if i was having the equivalent of a raw photograph in video i would have what we call color space of a 4444 four, four, four. and that means all four pixels are reading it this gross over simplification but all four uh pixels are writing their information for luminance for red green and blue if you're using an rgb sensor otherwise it's a YRCR BR, I think. Um, and it's just a level of compression. So if you think of a 444, you're keeping all the red, all the green, and all the blue information. If you take a 422, you're take, keeping, I believe you're keeping all the green, and then you're throwing away half, two of the, half the red and half the blue information. You still get a complete image because of uh, sort of voodoo camera programming that interpolates the rest of the information, but it's all implied information versus written to the card information. When you go to 420, you're keeping all of, I think it's the green, I can look this up, it's actually a Wikipedia thing I can pull up for this, but you're keeping all of one color and you're th throwing away half of the next color and you're throwing away all of the remaining color. And what that means is for that remaining color, there is zero written information for how bright it is, for how saturated it is, or how often it is in your frame. Your camera is doing all the hard work of interpolating through and or uh, calculations of what's missing. So if you have all of the first color and half of the second color, it can figure out how much of the third color you should have in your final image. And because of that, now it's thrown away half of the stored information at least and uh, so when you go to ask for that information it just doesn't exist does that sort of make sense or um, am I just confusing you more Yeah, so actually, 
do I have that? Let me see if I can plug in my uh, my Drobo here. I've got a storage drive here that's a bit finicky. Let me just see if I can plug it in real quick. see if the Drobo shows up and I'll I think I still got some 444 data on there um, I work in 420 <laughs> uh, typically so basically it's compression methods so 420 is your most compressed it anything that's not in the image typically gets thrown away 422 sort of keeps mo half the information it varies depending who's writing it uh, what manufacturer is using it um, and so it throws away a bunch of the information and interpolates the rest. So you have more information than 420 that you can have that's just latent in the image that you can pull out. Um, and also higher clarity and detail and all that stuff. 444 is the raw, is our version of raw in many ways. It's completely uncompressed color science. Um, 444 is expensive. Like, if you think that 4K footage is expensive, do not work in uncompressed formats. Um, 444, I think, when I was recording, I had a Sony PMW F3 cinema camera that did 420 internally, which was a stupid choice because everyone else was, a, they had the technology to do 422 internally. Um, but they chose not to. They chose to do 422. 420. Uh, pissed us all off. You needed a, an external recorder to unlock uh, 424, four, and it was only unlockable if you used a dual SDI connection. So you had two SDI cables plugged into the back of the camera, and you plugged those into an external recorder, which at the time it was a Convergent Design Gemini 444 recorder, and it would record a DPX sequence, so a series of image. It'd, be, it'd record an image sequence, essentially. And uh, so if I was recording 2398 footage, it would take 23.98 photos per second, just like you clicking your DSLR. It was basically the same thing. Um, and it would take it, raw didn't really exist at the time, it just took it in uncompressed 444 color space. DPX sequences. Um, each frame was about seven megabytes, I think. So each frame, you're doing that 24 or 30 times a second. So the output, I was using the only thing fast enough and the only thing that fit was custom 1.8 inch uh, SSDs. And 128 gigabytes would go by in about 20 minutes. And then I had a 256 that would last me about 38 minutes on uh, 24 frames per second. Um, so, you know, like if you think 4K is expensive, do not ever move into uh, uncompressed footage. <laughs> but that said, if I can get this Drobo to connect here, then I will show you just what you can do. Hmm, everything's jamming on me today. Wait for the program to respond. Okay, so let's see. Come on, Drobo. Yeah, this Drobo is jamming up my file explorer here. It's the reason I stopped using it a while back. Like, I love the idea. It's hot swappable RAID 10 storage, but just the connection issues started to pile up and it's just too slow to edit good footage off of. Okay, well, <laughs> we will see if this ever starts responding again. Okay, we'll close. Premiere, let it reboot. 
Yep, there goes my explorer. That's okay. We will just do a quick little explorer delete, and then we're going to run new task, explorer, and wait for it to say hi again. Come on, explorer. Yeah, it's a weird glitch. It's been happening to me recently. I'm having issues with Explorer itself jamming up. But in the meantime, I'll give you guys something to look at at least. Go like that. And we'll just wait for Explorer to come and say hi again. Okay, well, I guess we'll just sit and talk for a bit because uh, Task Manager's jammed up too. So, <laughs> what are you going to do? How are you guys all doing today? Enough of me talking. You guys got something going on today or you got more questions or... I know Records is usually in the shop, but it's a Saturday, so he should be hopefully not working today. jammed as well. I don't see a chat moving. Oh, no. There we go. No, it's working. Cool, cool. Okay, well, we'll give this a minute or two. And if it doesn't do that, I'm going to have to restart the stream real quick. Uh, just as I repower the machine. Okay, what's what's this about a couch flying away? Um, I like is this an IKEA couch and it's caught the wind off of your sailboat and you have like free Wi-Fi out there or something or um, is there some sort of hurricane hitting you? And yeah, on your 60, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure what codecs come pre-installed on that. I think you're probably going to have mostly access to just uh, H.264 slash H.265 is slowly making its way into the industry. It's more uh, it's more uh, CPU intensive, but H.264 uh, uh, 420 is what I'm guessing internally. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> um, Although it is a Mark II, so they might be doing something different, but typically on most consumer and even professional cameras, you're not getting anything better than 420 internally. Heck, most of the Sonys, they say 10, 10 bit codecs, and it's like, yeah, it's 10 bit. That's great. That's a, that's a huge, you know, they go from millions of colors to, or you go from hundreds of thousands of colors to millions of colors. But, uh, you know, they're, it's still not 422 because we're talking about uh, bit rate versus color space. Oh, records, after doing all the remodeling you've been doing, I don't think you should be doing much more right now. <laughs> what did you do to your shoulder? <laughs> yeah, no, I saw that on Twitter this morning, a big hurricane coming up to Newfoundland and I hope they're going to do all right out there. They're tough people out there. I figure they should be fine. Yeah, yeah, Thane, I sent you that link, so uh, feel free to join whenever you want. Um, actually, I think I'm going to have to reboot the stream here. Um, the R5, I don't know about the R5. I know the R3 is supposed to do internal Canon RAW. And to me, that would be a game changer. Like right now, I'm, I'm operating off of the Fuji X-T3. But... Uh, Again, it's 4K, but it's 420 internally, and over HDMI, you can only get 422 to an external recorder. For me, I'm a one-man band. I'm very lightweight, so if I had a crew, I would love all the dongles and you know all the extra pieces. But uh, I think for me, what I'm watching for is that R3. It's 
supposedly it's meant for sports shooters. I don't care. It can do 20 megapixels. That's fine for me. Um, but it can do 4K or 6K raw internally, which gets my attention because now that means the like I used to carry a 15 pound or 10 pound rig and Sony PMW F3 with a PL 18 through 55 millimeter lens plus the Gemini recorder all strung together on top end power as well as well as the rod and rail system and a follow focus like the whole rig just to get high quality cinema grade uncompressed footage and now I can do it in the size of a 1DX like that that's a no-brainer for me <laughs> I can throw that on my glide cam no steady cam needed just throw that on my HD 2000 glide cam um, and uh, take off you know throw in the back of the truck and get some great recordings oh frick records <laughs> well take care of yourself use some of that icy hot uh, product whatever that is um, I'm gonna restart this stream here I'm gonna reboot the whole computer real quick and uh, we'll see if that fixes all of my issues because like even task managers jammed up right now so I'm just gonna do a hard reset and I'll be back, give me about five minutes, maybe less, maybe as short as two or three minutes. And I'll be back on here, uh, ready to go. Okay, well, oh, take care. Okay, can you guys hear me? Testing one, two, one, two, three, four. I think I'm back. There we go. Do my buttons work? Of course they don't. Let's go set up my buttons again. Um, yeah, and uh, Oh, nice. Okay, so I got to get you some new links there, Thane, because apparently I didn't save my project file. So just stand by one moment here. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, never mind. I'm going to do it mouse control only. Okay. Do we have any music? We don't. This is a problem. Okay, I think that Drobo is the problem of everything right now the cause of all my problems. So let's uh, try this again without the Drobo. Hmm. Okay, that's weird. There we go. Let's get that music going again. Okay. Oh, and this time I gotta save my project file. So Drobo is a bad idea. <laughs> uh, so we'll uh, we'll leave that out of the conversation for now. All I was trying to show with it is uh, there's a shot. Actually, I wonder if I have it on on a browser or something. Let's go to. Uh, let's go up here. And uh, so the big thing that I was trying to show with that 
is that uh, the amount of information you retain when you have a uh, uncompressed color space. Okay, good. Vimeo, stop doing that. Is astonishing. Like, simply mind blowing. So, for example, actually, let's let's get a thane in here real quick. Uh, let's add an input. Let's do a video call, but don't worry about video. Just leave your camera off thing. So here is your join link, and here is a password for you. Okay, so where were we? Oh yeah, so basically 444, the really cool thing about it is if you take a look at this image here, which, all right, I have to switch it manually right now. Let's uh, go to there. So this image here, um, this was not shot like this. This was shot with the truck in exposure, like getting their skin tone there and the grill and getting that in exposure because that was our hero. Then this, all this blue sky and everything, um, if I could get my Drobo to connect, I would show you. Maybe I'll have that ready for next time. That was white. Like, in my camera, in my viewfinder, that was just white. Um, and uh, the shadows underneath, that was just black. Like, I had very little dynamic range in a Rec. 709 image because that's what uh, that's what an a an H.264 is typically using. Uh, you can use something else like you know uh, back in the day you had Magic Lantern with Canon and you could record in like a C log or uh, their own version of C log S log C log all that stuff. That's just flattening the image so that you have a better chance of retaining detail, but it's still compressed. So in a Rec. 709, as opposed to a flat image profile, those blacks were black. Like you could see the bumper, but you couldn't see underneath the truck. And you, could, you couldn't even see the sky. You could see the trees and they were blown out behind them. What 444 uncompressed allowed me to do, so it's a combination, it's uncompressed. So that's kind of like raw before raw existed. And it's, un and it's 444, which means that it's storing all four units. It's storing full information on each color channel instead of throwing anything away. With that, I brought it into Resolve and I was able to create a mask behind the truck. And the mountain here, it was also gone. And I was able to pull that back. This was one zone. The mountain was one zone. Um, the sky was another zone. And, between, and then I had a third zone to sort of level them out to make some global adjustments on all of them. And that allowed me to uh, pull that sky right back into the image. So you can see the fluffy clouds when nothing existed before. Yeah, don't worry Thane, let me actually, let's, let's take a break and let's bring you in here. Um, so we're gonna get rid of that, we're gonna get rid of that. Okay, so you'll want to mute me on YouTube, otherwise you're gonna get terribly confused. Um, but I'm gonna, send my audio to you directly now, Thane. And I will bring you into the program. Testing one, two, are you there, Thane? Hello, hello, can you hear me? Oh, actually, no, I need to enable my, there we go. Hello, Thane, can you hear me? Oh, hello? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you, can you hear me? Awesome. Yes, I can hear you. Um, okay, how close can you get to your microphone there? Uh, I can actually turn up the input too. Is this better? Oh yeah, that's better. Okay, so uh, anyways, thanks for joining. <laughs> Gives me someone to talk to instead of open air. Yeah, um, sorry, I'm still late. Oh, no worries. No worries. Life happens. Um, so yeah, the big thing is, what I was saying to everyone on stream here is, with video, there's different compressions and there's different color spaces and there's different uh, codecs and they all play in tandem with each other to try and 
create either the best image or the most compressed image, like the best for what your purposes are. So if you're using H.264 uh, co co uh, compression with a, or codec with a 420 compression color space, you are getting the least amount of information with the highest CPU bandwidth required to process that image, but you are getting a tiny file compared to any of these other things. You go to a Cineform that's a less compressed, which means that your computer doesn't have to work as hard to decode and encode the information, but um, it also takes up a lot more space. And then you add uh, you add a, a color space to that, your 444, 420. You can have a Cineform 420, which is going to preserve the least amount of information, but be nice on your CPU. Or you can have a 444 Cineform, which is going to have the most information and still be nicer to your CPU than an H.264 would be. <laughs> and I'm sorry oh, that you're ready. jumping in the deep end here. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> uh. I admit I'm not, I'm not very knowledgeable. I feel like the most that I know about this kind of stuff I learned from like the Corridor Crew. <laughs> oh, Corridor Crew are awesome dudes, man. I w one of these days I'd love to work with them. I don't know if it will ever happen, but uh, what they do with how little they do it with is just incredible. Yeah, I'm definitely uh, I'm definitely a fan of theirs, but I feel like I haven't watched any of their stuff in a while, but I saw they had Seth Rogen on the VFX artist thing, and I really wanted to check that out. <laughs> yeah, that popped up in my feed this morning. I'm going to check it out in a bit. But yeah, they're really good. They do they take their time to explain a lot of stuff, especially their I hate React videos. Like, you know, the, ooh, watch this episode and React with a webcam on. I hate those videos, so I almost didn't start watching their series. But their series of VFX artists and stuntmen and React and all that, is oh, it's actually different. really good. Um, yeah, it's a different breed for sure. Yeah, it's qualified professionals talking about their area of expertise and why decisions might have been made one way or the other or what limitations might have existed. So, yeah, them talking about limitations is always interesting when they said, like, for example, like that scene at the end of Black Panther, which just doesn't look good. Oh, and they, and, you know, everyone hates on it. And then it's like, <laughs> well, what, like what actually happened, though? Yeah, and it, it usually comes down to time. Like anything that I'm dealing with, it comes down to time as well. So, yeah, you really can't protect yourself too well against that. But uh, let's, let's go ahead and I'll not plug in the Drobo this time, but I'll open up the uh, that project we had open earlier. Um, da -dum -da -dum. So, yeah, so a lot of people in the chat that I'm seeing right now, they're all from a sort of a photo community. Um, in, uh, I guess these are the ones who are interested in video. So uh, all you quiet people there, you can maybe ask a few questions if you got them, or I'm just going to continue rambling. Up to you. <laughs> you know, my sister actually got me, tried getting me really into uh, to photography, but I've never really been able to take up on it too hard. I don't know. It, it feels one of those hobbies that's like kind of high bar of entry in terms of money. You know what I mean? Yes, and also no, because if you do it the way that most YouTubers say to do it, it's extremely expensive. Um, if you do it with a bit more of a cautious mind, shall we say, or a, or a considering mind, then you're usually, you'll be fine. Um, it does cost a bit to enter, but not significantly so, especially if you're willing to work with older gear that works just fine it's just not the latest and greatest with all the bells and whistles right right i mean yeah my sister was trying to get me into it and and she was like oh you can try my gear but she was <laughs> of course doing this when she lived in taiwan and i was still in i was living in new york and i was oh. like how is that supposed to work huh? just <laughs> mail it back and forth <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> So, uh, you know, I haven't lived with her in a while, but if I ever end up living in the same house as her again, then maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Um, and Brad, you know, if if I ever go to Calgary, which my wife has family there, um, that would be awesome. Just to go have a beer and uh, maybe bring the cameras along for fun, but not need to. But I can see definitely having fun with a good beer or two and a little portrait session or photo walk or something. They seem like really chill guys. Uh, Brad here in uh, 
chat. He lives in Calgary and he knows some fairly prominent uh, camera YouTubers, uh, DP re oh, really? review guys over in Calgary. They've got a very level headed, like everyone else is hype or most other people are hyping one product over another or saying, oh, there's a war going on between brands or they're trying to pull drama out. And these are like the most chill Canadian guys you can see where they're just like, yeah, you know, this camera is nice, but I didn't like this part about it. And, you know, but this kind of redeems it a bit. And, you know, just a little more level headed than the rest of the Internet. <laughs> just, a, just a little bit. <laughs> are you are, are you also in Canada? Al? Yeah. Yeah. I'm over in the Vancouver Lower Mainland. Oh, OK. I'm living in Montreal. Oh, fun. Oh, a whole bunch of Canadians in the party. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, I'm hoping I can be inducted into Canadian life soon anyway. I'm working on it. <laughs> like oh, I yeah. said, I'm, I'm from New York, so I have a, a long road ahead of me. <laughs> yeah, well, and Montreal is going to be pretty... Like, Toronto and Montreal... Toronto especially is going to be more New York flavored. Um, I remember I went there to do a, uh, a video project just a month pre-COVID, like last year, March. Um, I brought a 4K little camera and some lighting and all that I, I went with a backpack a camera a camera sling and a roller suitcase and I had a three-point lighting kit with a laptop live switching with a 4k camera tripod stands everything and I traveled from Vancouver to Toronto set up did backstage interviews for a company that we work for frequently and uh, you know did those interviews for three days straight, turned them around, had them on the internet before I went back to Vancouver. Uh, wow. And the people there, it's like West Coast. It's more relaxed. Like I can say that definitively now. It's more relaxed. You go to Toronto and everyone has to look good. Everyone has to look their part. And they're always on their way to something. They're always rushing somewhere. And it's like, in Vancouver, we'll rush around, but it, it looks sloppy compared to them. But... I think we have it's a well old machine over there. <laughs> oh, frick, man. I guess you have to be. But, yeah, that's uh... true. Well, I mean, I did leave New York after all. I am kind of looking for maybe a chiller city experience. I actually have thought about moving to Vancouver. Oh, yeah. Well, don't go to downtown Vancouver. It's way too expensive right now. But Yeah, uh... I've heard. <laughs> oh, man, it's terrible that way. I've heard just like Vancouver as a whole is like the most expensive city in the world. <laughs> it's getting there. It actually is getting there. I'm a little outside of Vancouver. I'm in the lower mainland general, but uh, Montreal is New York flavored with a French accent. <laughs> 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 nice, Brad. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's about right. <laughs> I've been living here for a few years. That's that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I have friends over in the Gaspé Coast and Montreal and all that. So, yeah. I, I can agree with that. One place I want to go back, and I want to make a video when I'm there, is I want to go back to Montreal, and I want to, uh, I want to go to Saint Joseph's Oratory. Um, it turns out remotely through a long series of familial connections, like biological connections, I'm actually related to the guy who built that. Uh, oh wow! Uh, but like I've been there once, and I barely remember it. I want to go back. It's so beautiful. It's such a landmark it's a piece of canadian history at this point um and i just want to go back and i want to do some video work around there and just see what i can capture but uh, yeah i mean that sounds beautiful i've actually i've never been but oh, uh, i know i've been here for so long <laughs> <laughs> we, we've got to meet halfway then we'll meet halfway um yeah maybe i'll go I, i've got a little Tacoma, four-door Tacoma, long box. So <laughs> I'll drive from here to Calgary. I'll pick up Brad. We'll put all of our camera gear in the back of the truck, except the cameras will go right behind the seats. And uh, then we'll drive all the way to Montreal. And you said you're in Montreal already. So um, we'll yeah, just exactly. I'll there. just be, I'll just we'll, be chilling. We'll, we'll crash your couch because um, yeah, we're, we're paying <laughs> gas the whole way. It's a Tacoma. It's not, it's, it's not super fuel efficient. Uh, we'll crash your couch save on the uh save on the what you call it to get on the hotels and exactly. we'll do a bunch of you know hang out do some video projects do some photo projects um and may, heck maybe play some D, D. we'll get brad inducted into the D, &D world oh yeah exactly <laughs> i actually have a i have a friend here who's really into photography and I, i'll tell him he should check it out because i've actually i don't think he's ever been there either he usually hangs out more like you know 
like the parks and like the Olympic Stadium. Oh yeah. And he doesn't really check out the churches as much, so I should uh, I should give him a heads up about that. Oh cool. Um, just be prepared for a good do dose of Catholicism. It is a cathedral. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> um, fair enough. <laughs> and whether you believe in this stuff or not, there are tons. If I remember correctly, there are tons of like crutches and other utility implements that you know for people who are crippled um that are just hung up on the pillars there because people have walked in there with the implements with the wheelchairs and whatnot and been on their own two feet walking out huh. so it's quite a place with a lot of history um actually i don't know if you still have the youtube uh window open but maybe just keep an eye on the chat there um because i'm responding a little bit to people and there's brad's telling you that you should go to moncton and i totally agree with him moncton is amazing <laughs> Really? <laughs> oh yeah. Um. Anyways, I should probably load some footage into the the software here. <laughs> Oops. Uh. So okay, in Premiere, I'm using. I should get something to do uh, shortcuts for me to show the shortcuts. But uh, hello, thank you. Let's go media. So for me, it's always about. Okay, why are my shortcuts not working? Murphy's Law. You go to show something off and. Uh, it's gone. Everything wrecks it on you. Um, L shortcuts, yeah. So Control B. New custom bin. New bin, yeah. It's Control B. Why is it not working? Oh, now it works. Sweet. Let's just call that Pebcac. Um, and Nina. Oh, welcome. First of all, I... welcome Nina. Um. But yeah, no, that's it, it is incredible. Our video packs. When I started doing video, it was in the VHS days. We had giant shoulder VHS cameras. Um, and my editor was a seven stack of professional read write VHS players. Um, <laughs> what we would do is we would because we don't want to wear out the tapes, we would first make a working copy. That was our so you had your originals, you had your working copy. And what you would do is on the top layer, you would just take your originals and a blank tape and you'd hit play as you hit record on the second one. And you would let the whole tape re-record onto the second tape. And you'd take that first tape and you'd put it in a box called originals. And then you take your second, you take your second, uh, your seconds would always be uh, what you worked on. They were your working copy. And if your working copy wore out because you used it too much, you would create a new working copy off of the originals. <laughs> Go roll a truck over. Man, take some photos. I'd love to see <laughs> if you're allowed anyways. Um, and so what we would do is we would build shot by shot. We would have the top layer with our with what we're taking from. And we would record the specific clip that we wanted in and out onto the layer below and we would build the scene one clip at a time and then when we had that scene that tape that we were recording to was labeled as scene one and we put it in a vhs near the bottom uh, just one up from the bottom and then we'd do the same thing we'd take working copies on the top le level record it one level down and build a second scene and we put that in the second vhs up or the third vhs up i guess and label that scene two. We do that all the way up for as many stacks as we had. For us, it was seven. So we could only do six scenes in one go. And then, uh, oh, you started with, well, ENGs are still used a lot. Um, like the the P2 card format. But uh, were you using like the mini DVs or the DVs or? <laughs> yeah, it was a process. And eventually at the end, what you would do is you'd hit record on the bottom layer and then you hit play on each successive layer up. And you'd have your your output, your export. Um, but yeah, what I'm curious, what, what sort of technology did you have on your ENG? Was it, uh, oh yeah, DVs, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I was probably doing the consumer option when you were doing the professional option at that time. <laughs> I was so glad because a few years later, uh, the first uh, non-linear editor, software-based editor, came out, and we had a mini DV camera. And for me, the most zen process was 
doing the in out selections along a mini DV import tape and just using it over Firewire in out in out watch the whole thing back hit capture and let it play out and then you're doing all of your key wording and your tagging and everything and your sorting but uh, I kind of miss that process like it's super slow and I wouldn't want to have to do it as a small business or anything because it just takes too much time in this world but you know I kind of love to go back to that at least for therapeutic reasons <laughs> hey there sorry hey. I'm back oh no worries no worries <laughs> so I'm just importing my music here um, or I thought I was uh, am I not importing my music import files yes please there we go so we got a bunch of rejects so this is all the music that I had available when I edited the project so let's go get the footage now Just name that T4I. And what is alpha attempt? Let's find out. Okay, yeah. Oh gosh. And was my image... Are these like just preview files or something? Like they... I remember being able to keep things in focus. No, those are all project files rendered maybe? Okay, that doesn't show like anything. Um, actually, I should... You're seeing my screen right now, Thane, right? Like you're getting yep, a feedback? Okay, cool. Okay, so those, I do not know what's going on. So yeah, this is sort of the process I do whenever I open up a project from a client. is just go through and try and understand what the heck's going on with it. But this one has a lot of broken pro uh, files, so we're just going to put that in ADS leftovers. Lots of titles. We're not going to be able to use those at all. Um, yeah, I guess this is sort of the... F oh wait, that's a CR2 file. Get rid of that. I just don't know why it looks like such low quality footage. Okay. Okay, that's all right. Let's load them in. Let's see what happens. Even if we just make a crappy project out of this, it's good enough to show the process. Let's go right there, and let's make uh, footage. Yeah, being able to just drag and drop stuff in with this modern technology. Uh, I, I hear all the people all the youngsters who are complaining about, oh, it's so much work to do this or that. It's like, you have no idea. You, you honestly have <laughs> no idea the work that used to have to be done. And I'm not even talking film. Like one of one of my mentors back in the day, um, he actually worked as an assistant camera, first, second, and third assistant camera for Vancouver, Hollywood. And uh, the stories he has to tell, holy frick. Just getting daily so the directors can see what they actually filmed was a process. It was a whole 24 hour turnaround process. Oh my god. Yeah. That's kind of crazy. Oh yeah. Well, the thing is, you're shooting on celluloid. Now you have to tape it up and hope that there's no light leaks, send it off to the lab, have it developed and scanned and sent back on a hard drive so that you can watch it on the TV. Right. So. It's funny, because I, I, I work with uh, I work with people who do video a lot, like, and it's it's so different now. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's amazing just what's happened. Okay, so let's see. Okay, that's junk clip. So we're going to sort this into junk, and then we're going to continue into uh, yeah. It's, uh, what should we call this? We'll call it usable. Or actually, no, we'll call this bridge. So that, this, I think, is junk. And this one here. I'm just not sure if you guys are hearing. I don't think you guys are hearing what's going on screen, so that's, that's fine for now. So that's bridge. OK, 
Okay, that's also bridge. That's also bridge. And yeah, I just go through and I try and make sense. Usually other editors will have a uh, system built in, but they it's often so different from yours that's worth... If you don't destroy it completely and bring it back, uh, at least going through it and trying to understand what they did and translate it to what you want. Uh, and watching through the footage is sometimes very awkward, but uh, <laughs> necessary. So there we go. Okay. So you said you have some friends who do uh, video work. What sort of work are you talking about? Like more broadcast or more promotionals or? Um, well, it's kind of a, a startup sort of situation. Uh, a couple friends and I started um, a, a media company in when we were in college. And uh, we graduated and now so it's kind of our full-time thing. Oh, nice. Yeah, nice. it's a it's a it's a cool. You know, I'm doing web development, and there's a couple. You know, so we have people on staff who are doing video, and then there's brand work, web like web design, all sorts of stuff. And we work with nonprofits. It's kind of our thing. Okay, so you kind of do like a one stop shop for any company that needs most things. Yeah, exactly. It's usually you know we we often you know we work with social good uh, and like social enterprises kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it's pretty much, you know, if you need, if we work with a lot of nonprofits that are like stuck in the nineties, you know what I mean? Oh yeah. <laughs> and so they come to us and they say, all right, we're going to redo your brand. We're going to make you a website. We're going to make you a promotional video. It's going to be great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I feel like a lot of companies in this day and age could use a bit of an update. Exactly. Yeah. Most of the ones I deal with are either completely hip or stuck in like the nineties and yeah. nothing in between. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's unfortunate, but you know it's it's a uh, it's always you know it feels good you know to like help people who like they just don't <laughs> they just technology is a no like it's just the whole thing is a no and you're like okay we're gonna get you set up it's gonna be fine don't pa don't panic it's okay <laughs> yeah yeah especially when they come to you wide eyed and they're like oh my goodness I don't know what's going on. But, I mean, this is also what's, this is what's so great about all of the, the kind of advancements as far as like video is concerned. Like, it is extreme. Like this kind of thing would not be possible for us to do unless it was that easy. No, um, and yeah, just this last year has just shown how much we can do virtual stuff, and the yeah. technology has been here for a while. It's just the application of it and people actually implementing it has been a has been a bit delayed. Yeah, yeah, sadly. Well, that's also the kind of startup culture. It's kind of like you have the, you know, we're, we're always constantly looking for new things to do because it's there's not really a status quo, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Hey, and I see uh, Ronald arrived. How's it going there, Ronald? And do I pipe you in to talk with us live? Because I can totally just send you a link here, and we can have you in on the conversation too. Eh, we'll wait to see what he says. But yeah, okay. Well, that's cool. I didn't know you had so much. Uh... I didn't know you had so much uh, of a foot into media. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of. I guess it's sort of a. It's sort of a, it's a strange world that I kind of got thrown into because it was like a, you know, like the startup culture. You're just kind of like, oh, we need a guy that can do web stuff. And they're like, my roommate who does the video actually was like, I, I know a guy who does computer stuff and I never really had done web development, but then I ended up, <laughs> <laughs> but then sounds, I learned. It sounds like my wife, she uh, picked up a job as a bookstore clerk. And uh, part of the reason why she got hired is she knows how to do a bit of HTML. Mm. And so she basically had to dust off all of her high school HTML stuff and relearn how to hack it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty similar to what I ended up doing. <laughs> yeah. 
she's been trying to convince that boss to get onto uh, a dedicated platform at some point. But uh, he's very resistant to it. He doesn't want to pay mm. a monthly subscription. It's like, yeah, but you get all the security features and you right. get all the UI enhancements and you get the customer happiness and they have auto responders and stock inven inventory stock and all that stuff too. Yeah, there's just a lot more stuff going on that you have. Like it's 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 strange though. It feels like it's very much gated off so that you have to be in the business to understand exactly what's going on. Yeah. That's just why I use like stuff like Squarespace and Wix and <laughs> Foundation because I don't know any of that. Yeah, I will say though, it gets it, I definitely I started there and it gets very frustrating the when you learn more and more, it just becomes it feels more like a hindrance than anything. Yeah. But of course, it's meant to be a dummies platform. Like There's like um, you know Webflow, you ever heard of it? I have. I don't know much about it though. They're claiming that they're like, you know, a, a cross between like the dummies platform but also like any programmer can do whatever they want, which like I don't know if I believe that, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll see. I'll have to check it out at some point. Yeah, I'm actually gonna. I'm actually gonna run to the bathroom really quick. I have to sure. I cut my finger quite bad yesterday. I have to replace Ooh. the band. Oh no. Okay. Yeah. See you soon. <laughs> I'll be right back. You all there are getting pretty quiet. Either you're really interested or you're really bored. <laughs> How's it going out there? So what I'm doing right now is I'm just going through still and just dividing up according to locations. Normally I would read the, uh, the script or the sheet, the tech sheet before I do this, just to get an understanding because it can use the same location for multiple things. But I'm also aware that when I shot this, each location was used only by itself once. Um, so this is uh, Thane. He's a fellow I met on Discord. We uh, play RPGs together. Uh, this, uh, so, you know, different, whether you D D, Blades in the Dark, this sort of stuff. We've played a couple of sessions together and we're, we both run our own games. So uh, I was looking around for just someone to chat with to bounce off of today, and uh, he was up for the task, and so I'm just bringing him in and having some fun. I heard Blades in the Dark. Yes, Blades in the Freaking Dark. Uh, Ronald in chat here is wondering uh, who I'm talking to. And, ah, uh, yes. Hello. Yeah, so this is Thane. We He's run a Blades in the Dark game for me. I haven't done one for him yet. Yeah, I was supposed to, but I missed it like a like a silly fool. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> about that, by the way. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, you were you were lined up and everything, but uh, I guess the alarm didn't go off. <laughs> Actually, I don't even remember what happened that day. But yeah, I mean, I I really want to get in on the next one for sure. How did it go, by the way? It went really well. Actually, another fellow that I'm not used to. I actually forget his name. I'd have to look at the Discord. He doesn't talk much on the Discord, but uh, we he joined at the last moment and I'm he's actually way more experienced than I am so most of the time I just deferred the rules to him like he would okay. he would trust my call and I would explain my call but he was also informed enough because Blades is a very conversational uh, come to an agreement sort of game versus D&D &D, which is no I'm the DM I told you to do this just do it um because of that, he was able to help me and ping pong back and forth to get the right result. Yeah, it's, that's, I think one of my favorite things about Blades is that, like, I feel like among, you know, like one of my issues with D&D is that it kind of creates this environment that is almost like DM versus players, like culturally. Yeah. And Blades is kind of very, I mean, a lot of games are different from that, but like much more like, no, we are here together to have a fun time. We're going to have yeah. a fun time together. Yeah, exactly, and that's sort of how I see it as well, and actually I'm trying to get my group into it a bit. I just ran a one-shot that turned into a two-shot for them, so they haven't finished yet, but uh, we're sort of walking through the ropes of just, no, it's a negotiation. It's always a negotiation, um, and then once we reach an acceptable outcome, then we roll the dice. Nice. Hmm. 
<laughs> You'll love to see a game like that. Yeah. Okay, well, as long as you guys aren't bored out there, I'm just... As some of you know, editing is a long and tedious and slow, calm, zen process, so... As long as you guys aren't... Aren't getting pissed at me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to stay on chatting, but I did want to ask you, what was that game you were mentioning that you think you wanted to show me? Um, show you... I'm trying to think... Oh, oh, have you ever played Tabs? Tabs. If you know what Tabs is, you know what it is. But if you don't, then I can totally surprise you with. Okay. Well, with... no, I don't think I, I don't think I have played it or heard of it. Okay. That that's a game that we might have to bring me the shots out for. To be honest, um, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's very much a drunken, uh, oh yeah, well I do this sort of game. Ah yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Well, you put that down. Well, I'm gonna do this now. And it's uh, trying to one-up each other and beat each other out. That sounds like a good time. Yeah. Um, my I I bought it on a whim, and I thought I was going to get in trouble with my wife. <laughs> and I showed <laughs> it to her. I'm like, okay, you just got to trust me. I got it on a sale, so it wasn't a big loss anyways. Um, I'm just like, you got to trust me. Just, just let, let me, let me yeah. show you this game. And I pulled it up, played it. And at first she's like, oh, really? But then after that, uh, she's been addicted to it. And we're always trying to one-up each other. Oh, nice. It's on Steam? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's exclusively on Steam. And I'll I have no idea what this is. Like, it's a clock, obviously, but... Let's see if I can get a better sense of what's going on here. Maybe two projects mixed together? Because I don't recognize this location at all. Is that a chess piece or pepper grinder? Or... I think it's a pepper grinder. That's like my final grinder. answer. Looks well, kind of like my pepper grinder anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Tabs, you said? Tabs. Yeah, don't look it up. Don't, don't look it up. I will show you. <laughs> okay, I couldn't find it anyway, so it's fine. <laughs> okay, yeah, we'll load it up. And uh, Do you have Parsec on your computer? Or st I, I, guess... I have Parsec, yeah. Okay, we'll do Parsec if you want to add me. Um, I'll... <laughs> give you a uh, mouse and keyboard control okay yeah uh, i'm ronald i'm trying to figure this out um i don't recognize this project but it's in the same folder as the project i was opening so i don't know what this is i'm just going to type unknown project um, and, but this is definitely the uh the color on this is way off i would never want to shoot this not unless it's for an art film or something, but uh, this is, they probably had, like looking at this, these bulbs are typically fluorescent kitchen bulbs, which live around the four, between the 38 and 4200 Kelvin color temperature. In my experience, at least, like you can get warmer ones, you can get cooler ones, but your standard light bulb is around like 3800 uh, Kelvin. So to get it this orange, they probably had their white balance cranked all, all the way up to like fifty-seven or sixty some odd thousand. Um, and that I'm still trying to figure out because that does not look like me. That's not how I hold cameras. Like I don't that grip. I usually put my hand on the bottom. I find it's far more stable. You, if you put your hand here and your hand here, you've got a grip here that you can hold, which is great. But then you're just kind of clutching on the slippery side of the body on this other side. So that's not something I do. Usually I put all the weight on my hand down here and then I control the camera with my hand here. So I'm as much in confusion like as any of you guys are. It's completely out of focus. We got some sort of tea kettle there. I think this might have been a case where, but I don't know how I'd get this content from someone. I don't have a knife like that. Huh. Yeah, what are we doing? Thor 1? Dutch tilt for not for Dutch tilt's sake, it's not worth it. Thor 1 Dutch angles? Yeah. <laughs> That's very funny. 
Okay, now we're I think seeing I've only seen that movie like once. Yeah, yeah. Now we're seeing someone's like bedroom or something. Like I see Xbox controllers. Some board games. I have no idea what this is. We're just gonna put it over here. We're solving a mystery. Yeah, well that's that's sort of the fun as well, is I I've, I've picked up projects and there's just stuff mixed in there all over the place. But I don't know any oh, we got a foot. We've got a foot and a pajama. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um do some Italian Italian stuff of that there, Ronald. <laughs> Okay, and back to my footage, which is horribly overexposed. Like this is this is actually back to the conversation earlier. This is why I love 444 uncompressed or 422 uncompressed or uh 422 ProRes compressed, like lossless compression instead of lossy compression. Because if you look at this here, if this was lossless compression, this is lossy, it's H.264 super compressed 420 inside of a Canon Rebel DSLR. If I was filming this with a, with a 422 recorder or a 444 recorder or something like that, and I was recording it in Cineform, ProRes, DPX sequences, Canon, RED, Sony RAW, like I don't care, something like that, I would be able to take that sky and bring it back, which in and of itself isn't important because you look at a lot of broadcast work and the sky can be blown out. It doesn't matter. But the thing is, is look at those trees. If I, okay, fit, let's go to 150%. If I go to these trees, this is the part that I don't like is because yeah, okay, we've lost the sky, who cares? But now we've got these floating leaves and just the bloom that's surrounding the trees in my mind is if it's avoidable, this is unacceptable to have. Like this is more important than getting the sky back is getting those details on the trees. Just so you know, I just sent my uh, Parsec username in the uh, Discord. Sweet. Um, I will add that when it comes time to doing some gaming. Do you have a time limit today? Yeah. yeah. No, I don't. No rush. I was just... Okay. Yeah. In a few hours, my wife and kid are coming back from a baby shower, so I'm sure I will be able to continue just fine, but uh, you'll hear yelling four-year-old every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> it's an apartment. Okay, this is just a static shot. Okay. Oh yeah, there, there's my signature rack focus. I, I've gotten into a lot of trouble because I just cannot resist doing a rack focus. Um, <laughs> I just, I find them just this silky smooth, especially if you pull them off nicely. Just a silky smooth, beautiful rack focus. Works better than a pan most of the time. I'd be curious to hear, actually, sorry, I'm just thinking about this now. Mm -hmm. I'd be curious to hear your opinion on, uh, I was just watching the other day, did you see the Avatar M. Night Shyamalan movie? That's, un okay, Confession, that's yeah. the one I saw first. Really? Yeah. And then did you watch the show after? <laughs> um, I watched the show when all the YouTubers got access to it on Netflix and started making video documentaries on it and video essays. Mm. It sort of alerted me to the fact that it existed on Netflix. And uh, and uh, I watched it from there. But anyways, you had a question <laughs> instead of me. Rambling. Yeah, I just so I just I mean, I love Avatar The Last Airbender. I grew up on it like it's like my favorite show or like at least one of them. And uh, I just watching the movie, you know, it's funny because they messed up a lot of things in the movie, but oh, one God. of them is just, it feels like it's edited really poorly. And personally, I, I mean, you as an editor, I feel like you have more insight on this, but like I, one thing that I personally observed that I felt really proud of myself for being intelligent enough to observe <laughs> is that the movie does not have any like establishing shots. Like when a scene ends, they just cut to the middle of another scene. Yeah. Actually, you know what? And it, um, I'm going to do this off screen so that I can't be called out on it later, but I'm going to pull up um, a certain uh, 
way of acquiring footage to play around with from Avatar. So keep talking, and I'm going to do this in the background. Oh, yeah, it's just like... <laughs> I don't know. It was just a very funny movie to watch because it's like there's obviously all the things wrong with it where it's like they all the characters are weird, the bending looks terrible, the story is like torn apart. But then it's also just like shot and edited really weirdly. Aww. Also Dev Patel's in it and like I did not even realize that because <laughs> I had just seen The Green Knight like a, a few days earlier and The Green Knight is amazing. Yeah. But yeah, Dev Fatel looks like a little baby. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see if I can find this here. Legend of Korra, book one. No, I don't want the TV series. Hmm. Okay, let's back up. Let's do a search again. Okay, let's... There we go. I will see if I can have it available uh, soon here. But I will give you my thoughts visually on that one. <laughs> mm. That's um, ho exciting. <laughs> hopefully this doesn't kill my stream. My internet should be fine, but uh, you never know. Let's pause all these other ones. I just want that one downloading. Okay. Um, in the meantime, records, a rack focus. Oh, Nina's already answered. Yeah, so on my project here, if I go to train. So I think this shot here. So yeah, you see records here in the foreground. I have this uh, beam in, uh, in focus. But as I go through the clip, yeah, so there we go. There's the background in focus. And then I come back to the foreground. That is called a rack focus. Now, you can use them very quickly. In fact, they're used to sort of do reveals a lot. Like a quick rack focus will do a reveal of someone standing in the same room as our protagonist. And surprise, oh no, they're in trouble. I like using them for B-roll, for, uh, for secondary footage. Just especially with the shallow depth of field, I just love, again, I'm, I'm about the light. So if the, if the thing is lit nicely, I like just revealing that throughout the frame. Um, but yeah, <laughs> um, let's go to there. Okay. And we almost have it down. So I will load that up soon. Um, in the meantime, go like that. This is more of that room, which I'm just going to call bedroom. Oh, I think this is the one time we repeated a location. I'm going to stick it in the same bin just for consistency first. Oh, and here we go. This is actually um, anyone who's interested about compression and why you would want better color space. This is exactly why you want better color space. In here, I can promise you from being there and filming there is this is not this green <laughs> this red this blue is actually not part of the costume that is a color a chroma artifact from uh... <laughs> Ronald <laughs> um, this that's those are not actual fibers in the uh, in the fabric. In fact, you can see how it will cross across the actual fiber. These are, and they're randomized a bit. This is actually a chroma artifacting from not having enough information. It's sort of like banding. It's like getting the, the zebras, you know, the moire effect. That's actually literally what it is. It's the moire effect, like when you have pinstriping. Yeah, except chromatic aberration is caused by the lens, which again, this was on a kit lens. This was on a cheap, probably nifty 50 or an 18 through 55 millimeter Canon kit lens. I wasn't rolling in it back then. Um, so already there was going to be some chromatic aberrations through my lenses, but um, the moire here. Yeah, you're right. Let records. It is moire. Um, that is also caused 
by Moray, which is the camera sensor allocating uh, how much information it's going to store from each color channel and interpolating the difference. But when the detail is this fine, you get Moray. That's literally why it happens, is it's trying to compress something that's too fine to be compressed nicely. The way around this is to record in a better color space. Maybe do a global shutter would help with this a little bit so you don't get uh, some of the artifacting that happens with a rolling shutter. But these are all expensive options. So most of us just put up with it and make sure that our costume designer doesn't put more inducing costumes in frame. But uh, cameras are getting better and better at that as time goes on too. This is, again, this is a T4i from like 2009, 2010. So, you know, 10, 11 year old camera or 11 or 12 year old camera. They say they do, Ronald, they say they do. It's not amazing. <laughs> maybe, maybe these days I haven't used a Rebel since the T4i. So maybe they've improved, but there's, there's only so much you can polish a turd really because you're taking something and actually the, the, that filter that it's a low pass filter. Actually, yeah, you said, you said low pass filter, um, that low pass filter sometimes creates more problems than it removes. So it's sort of, it's a catch 22. You either have heavy more or you have this low pass filter that induces compression artifacts as well as the more and not really much you can do about it. You can't turn it off, but they're doing their best, you know, like, don't get me wrong. The basic Canon rebel cameras, as much as people love to hate on them or say that they're junk or cheap, they are still really great intro cameras. I would go, I actually considered going and grabbing one off the shelf um, and just recording cheap little videos with them again, just because they're fun little cameras. All the settings are right up front in your face. Uh, you don't have to go, oh, is it a submenu of a submenu or is it on the main menu or is it on a button or is it here or there or anywhere else? You just set it up and you record as long as you can deal with some of the limitations. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the T4i taught me everything I needed to know to then make the jump to the red one was the one I went to next. I a mixture because it was all rented cameras from then on. Um, so I worked. I went from the T4i and then I started working projects with the Red One and then the Red Epic and the Red Epic Mysterium sensor. And then from there, um, let's get my mouse over here. And from there, uh, I went to all sorts of things. I bought my own PMW F3, which was an amazing camera. Still is a really nice camera, actually. If I didn't, if I had projects that I could use it on, I would go and buy a, uh, an F3 used right now with an external recorder and make projects with it. It's just a beautiful camera, beautiful image, global shutter, um, you name it. Oh, frick, Brad, just sent me an image or two. That is, I think that might buff out just maybe, just maybe Brad. <laughs> uh, no, he sent me an image and it's a, uh truck that's gone over the uh, barricades on the side of the road and the front end is just crumpled. It'd be a job for you, Records. <laughs> Except it's a Dodge, so, you know. Um, anyways, Thane, have I lost you by any chance? Or are you still around? Uh, no, I, I'm oh, still okay. here. You're, you're just staying super quiet. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't want to. I You were talking about something I feel I'm not very knowledgeable oh, well, about. <laughs> that's totally cool. I just wanted to make sure the tech was still working. <laughs> Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, but yeah, okay, let's throw this into, uh, that's the same bedroom location. It is but a scratch. Okay, our testing one, two, can you guys still hear me? One, two, let's take a look at my bandwidth here. Okay. Okay, I'm back. Okay, sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened there. Am I good to keep going? There we go. Actually, if you don't mind, I'm going to go grab some food. I'll be right back. Okay, cool, cool.
Awesome. Thank Thanks, guys. Thanks. Interesting. Oh, I know what's going on. Sorry, guys. One moment. One moment. Um. Okay, that should fix it. That should fix it. <laughs> yeah, that's my internet for the month. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, I figured out what was going on. I downloaded a file, and then it was uploading and eating up all of my bandwidth. So we should be stable from now on. But, uh, yeah, keep me in the loop, guys. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what? What torrents? No, 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 no. Totally legal data transfer uh, software. <laughs> uh, so when thing comes back, I'll uh, I'll answer his question a little bit about Avatar there. If you guys are interested in that but in the meantime that's sort of that's one of the reasons to use higher cameras when people say you can do a feature film on a cell phone that is true I can take my cell phone I can do a feature film to a higher quality than I could have 10 15 years ago but that said when you start actually getting into the image and manipulating the image beyond just your original camera settings the image just breaks down in your hands um, maybe photos is a little more forgiving, but in video, they use a lot of algorithmic compression and fakery. Uh, Corridor Digital, uh, Ren from there, actually did a neat little breakdown in one of their videos. And it was showing they recorded something on phone and then they had to track it, but their tracking software kept missing. And they've got industry standard VFX tracking software. Um, but it kept missing the track and they had to go and correct it manually because they would basically use uh, pixel smearing to get things looking right, which is fine when you're recording a, a, a vlog or a YouTube video where you're not doing anything to it other than cutting it. But as soon as you start manipulating it, color correcting it, changing it, tracking it, uh, adding anything to it, now all of a sudden you're dealing with the pixel smearing and a lot of other tricks that they're using to keep the bandwidth low and keep it in HDR and everything else. So, as clunky as they are, bringing an Airy Alexa along is still your best bet for some things because it just captures what's there. And it captures stuff that you see with your eyes um, without any trickery. You just gotta bring it out in post and your pixels stay, the integrity of your pixels stay, stays. But anyway, so this is a example of why I think Either I didn't know better, or it was so orange in this room that I couldn't do better, because there's only so far that cameras will adjust their white balance for you. But to sort of tear into this a little... Actually, I need to actually load it into my timeline. Um, actually, let's do this in Resolve. I'm more familiar with color in Resolve. Awesome. You guys still there? Or are you all just listening? Um, but yeah, I'll open up Resolve here. And uh, just an untitled project. And we'll load in. Let's, let's grab this file here. Freelance Explorer. Let's grab that. Yeah, change the frame rate. Let's change the view to a extra large icon because why not? And we'll grab something that's halfway decent. Like, um, yeah, we'll grab this one. Yeah, just for just for giggles. Let's take a look at those. Um, I'll load both of those into my timeline. Boom. Let's go over to the color panel. So here, the biggest problem with this here is a blown out sky, which we're going to ignore for the <clears throat> for what I'm talking about here. Typically, in a standard workflow, I can go like this. Control S. There's my new node, and I can just go over to. Well, 
I, I think I'm going to use my wheels today. So they've got in primaries. I like it in log. Um, so if we take this, so this is a, f actually, let's do wheels for this time. So basically, the delay, well, there's a natural delay already. Like there's like a 20 second delay between me and you, um, just broadcasting. I think that's a YouTube thing as well, so not a ton that I can do with that. So the first thing I would do with this is I would take my white balance and I'd just fix my white balance. Look, it's mostly there. That's great. Um, and then across the whole image, all I'd really do is I would take down the shadows a little bit because it's taking it from sort of a flat image that was not intentionally flat. It was just Actually, no, I think I recorded it in uh, in Mad Black Magic's uh, flat profile. I forget. Or not Black Magic, uh, in Magic Lantern's Canon flat. Um, but, so to correct that, to bring it to a Rec. 709, I'd mainly be doing a little bit of this. And just as a really rough thing, like you can see, this is not good at all. This is a very terrible color grade. Um, let's bring that up just a little bit. Let's take our mid tones down a bit. That's a bit better. Something like that. And then our highlights. We want them. See, we're losing detail no matter how low we go on there. That's just the nature of shooting that day and my experience level, but you do want to punch a little bit like that. Um, we've lost her dress, unfortunately. Um, if I wanted to go in and really detail it in, I could probably bring a little bit of that back. But my major point is just, you look at this, and it's an all right image, it's not great. I can do way better these days, but it's all right. If I go to my next clip down here, starting from here, First, we have to bring it into the realm of acceptability. Never mind stylistic, never mind any of that. We've got to just make it look good at all. So we've got this massively orange frame. Um, it's Dutch tilted, unfortunately, so whatever. And if we look at people's skin tones, it's kind of a bit muddy. You know, he's, this is the guy we're supposed to pay attention to, so my lighting was not on point. Didn't really have a lighting kit to be honest um we we're just using available light for the most of it and this room was dark you know i'd at least want this guy to be a little bit in in exposure a bit better and then leave him shadowed back there <laughs> as long as you keep the nice beer coming i don't really care ronald <laughs> um so what i would start with this is just trying to figure out where white is like I don't even know where white is in this frame. There were closer, but then now we're introducing the magenta. So I'll start just by hitting this here. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, we want to bring the green out a little bit. Something like that should be white. And then we got to now try and, you know, like, there we go. Like, that's how I would have... I would have lit for about this today. You know, I would have put more stylistic light in here, but ex as far as exposure level, I would have started with this level of exposure in my image, simply because then I could always crush it after the fact. But now that it's crushed, bringing it up, well, that introduces, like, that guy's shirt is not, in fact, purple. Like, look at all that splotchiness. That's just far as I'm concerned, unacceptable, <laughs> you know? But uh, this is what we're dealing with here. Um, just because the camera recorded in 420, super compressed, super low light on a novice slash entry level camera, this is what we're stuck with. So to fix this, 
now that I've got white, now that I've got relative exposure, I would then create a, another window here. And I would actually start doing some selections. So let's take a power window. And what sort of power window do I want? Um, or actually, can I do it? Yeah, I think power window. What tool do I have? Oh, I know what I'm doing wrong. Okay, it's been a long time since I used this. Here we go. So I would like to take, I think I'd like to do a gradient this way. And you can see here in my, in my uh, nodes here. So color and resolve is all based off of nodes, not layers, which is handy because you can have multiple overlapping nodes which can affect each other in whichever order you want, not in whichever order is on top. So for instance here, what I would do is I would take that and I would do a little something like that to about there. And then we go back to our color wheels and what I would actually do, let's take our, let's decrease the black point a little bit. Uh, but maybe we'll do it through a gentle curve. And this is super scrappy right now, but uh, we're not going to keep this result anyways. And, you know, I do something like that, and can I feather it? Uh, softness inside. Yeah, I do a little feather like that. How do I do that? But anyways, you guys see what I mean. I'm talking more about the compression because now I'm having to salvage this side of the frame. Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, records, go and check out uh, his entire YouTube channel. He is invaluable and he will teach you way more than I know is even possible. Uh, Casey. Ferris, right here, this guy here. Everything I've learned about Resolve, I've learned from this guy. So go check him out, he is amazing. And he can he, he uses Resolve full time. I'm a Premiere editor typically. On nice images, what I'll do is I'll spend some time and I'll create some masks, like some sky masks. And I will go and bring the sky back and this sort of stuff, I do some very basic stuff in Resolve but I am by no means an expert. Uh, so anyways, what I'm trying to point out with this is just if we go uh, like this, this was our original image. And this is me trying to recover it. So I recovered some exposure here and I, and I uh, recovered my white balance here. And then now I'm having to do repair work and I'll put power windows over everything and feather them and I'll have to track them because the image, the, the frame is moving. So now I have to track those power windows to make sure they stay on the subjects properly. And it just, it creates so much work versus just getting it right in camera in the first place. Um, which this is nowhere near right in my opinion these days. But at the time, this was my opinion of what was right in camera. Oh, good, Brad. I'm glad you're liking it. <laughs> um... And Nina, yeah, Resolve. I've been with, Re I've been tinkering with Resolve from a color standpoint since Resolve 10 or 11, I think. And at that point, I would not have called Resolve a editor or a usable tool outside of color. It was all about exporting an EDL or, a, yeah, typically an EDL from Premiere, doing the color, exporting all of the clips out as, you know, Cineform uh, from Resolve and re-adding them to Premiere. Um, that was my workflow back in the day and it worked. These days I don't have to worry about that so I'm pretty happy but uh, that's why like do your lighting. Do your lighting. If you start if your image looks like this out of camera and it's got a 420 compression uh, color compression on it you're screwed as far as a nice clean image um, unless this is what you're going for in which case have at her. 
I wouldn't do this again though. Um, the only way to circumvent this would be to have either better lighting and record internally still because why whatever or to have you know some of these cameras with a high ISOs or whatever but one that records a beefier codec one that records a a more information as part of it that's the most important bit in my mind is good lighting and good compression ratios if you've got those two nailed you've got feature level quality But yeah, I have a feeling that we're probably going to take all of this and turn it into black and white and throw a film grain on top and call it a day. <laughs> okay, that's a bunch of goofs in there. Actually, that's in the office, but I think that's junk. That's just BTS. Go through all this. And then whenever a thing gets back, we can talk about Avatar, the last airbender, the unfortunate film, if that's... Sorry, I've been back. I, I didn't want to oh. interrupt you. <laughs> okay. You've just been letting me go on my own rant for a while. Yeah, I didn't want to I didn't want to interrupt your thought process. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, but yeah, res the problem with Resolve is it has just such a different philosophy to the editing. Um, that just doesn't make sense if you come from a Premiere or Final Cut workflow. But yeah, anyways, so our footage, after all that time, <laughs> our very inefficient culling of footage, uh, here we are with everything in the right spot. Let's just do a quick cheeky save here. Um, let's throw this on one side. So, actually, let's use this project file for this right now. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab this avatar clip. Let's go to there. No, where is it? Avatar Last Airbender. Let's take it. Let's throw it in here. Wrong project, but we're going to deal with it anyways. So here we go. We're not going to do copyright infringing stuff. We're whatever. We're going to throw it into a timeline. Boom. Now here's a little uh, trick for anyone who uses Premiere and needs to cut up a bunch, like a clip with a ton of sub clips as part of it and it's all baked together, is literally just take this and you go to, where to go, where to go? My eyes are tricking me here. What we want is we want to scene detect. Yeah, so scene edit detection. It's a right click scene edit detection. You hit that. And you say apply a cut at each detected cut point. Um, you can also do it where it puts a marker as well, or and you can make a bin of subclips. We're not doing any of those other two today. And you hit analyze. This is going to take a moment or two um, because I'm running vMix on one monitor. I'm watching the YouTube stream. I'm running Premiere, <laughs> so it's going to take a moment. But what this is doing is it's going through the entire feature film, and it's detecting anytime there's a hard cut. Um, so it won't detect fades, it won't detect morph cuts, but it will detect all the hard cuts, which will just give us a leg up of knowing where we are in the film, and we won't get lost scrolling around. That's interesting. There are some really bad fades as well. I will put that out there, but it's just, <laughs> <laughs> it's just interesting because, like, I mean, I my, like I said, my roommate does a lot of video stuff, and so I'm, I don't know, I think since living with him, I've become a bit more sensitive to it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. When, once you start... Uh editing and making content of your own, it's really, really tough to go back to being a passive observer on anything else. Yeah, it's kind of like um, like when I watched it when I was a kid, I still watched it and I was like, this doesn't feel right. This looks weird, but I couldn't <laughs> figure out exactly why. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, you want to know one film or one animated film that might as well be a live action, though, is what? How to Train Your Dragon series. Mm. Have you seen that? I have, yeah. I'm mean, always like, I think I've seen the first two. Okay, the third one is optional, as as far as I'm concerned. Like it's a, it's a, it wraps up the series, but it's kind of optional. Mm. Um, the, so the technology wasn't quite there for the first one, but they had all the pieces in place. The second time they had a bigger budget, they had better technology, and they went for it. 
but Roger Deakins consulted the lighting and cinematography on the first one, and he was actually in charge of it on the second one. And so yeah. every shot, like if you if you like Roger Deakins out on his own films, you will love just what he does and sort of the the cuts that he makes and the like. Okay, how to train your dragon too? Everyone's at the dragon race, yada yada yada. Then we cut to Hiccup, and and they're out there flying, and you're you don't cut to a close up of them flying. You don't cut to an over the shoulder. You don't cut to some action shot. You cut to a Deacon special ultra wide mm. of everything, and you see them enter frame, and then you start getting in close to them. But you get this sort of Lawrence of Arabia sort of feel uh, to it all. Actually, interesting. Um, no, I, I nerd out about that one. My kid loves that movie. Or he did. He hasn't seen it for a little while, but it yeah. was uh, I watched it when I when it first came out actually in the theaters and my dad was just oh, so man. impressed with like just the way it looked. I mean you mentioned the technology not being there, to be honest with you. In my memory, it feels like it all was. I don't even remember having any issues with how it looked, but I'm sure <laughs> you know there are limitations. But I was also a kid, so Yeah. You like know. you look at it now it's got it's it's still very good like the render quality and the lighting and the the subsurface scattering and all that stuff it's all there just the art style was a bit a little bit toy story a little yeah, bit yeah definitely um and i think they were still figuring out their style a little bit and by the second one they nailed it um yeah nina's got a good point here you know knowing it doesn't feel right like that feeling is everything and that's oh yeah that's sort of the thing is i'm able to teach how to edit uh as a, like the technology and there's lots of people on youtube who are teaching how to do the latest tiktok fad video and what steps you got to do and everything but where you really get a good editor and you know i'm a little bit on my way there but i still have a lot of journey to go is that instinct that knowing what will work what will land what will sell and right how long like the most expensive editors you're not being paid for being for pushing the buttons in fact a lot of the most expensive editors don't actually touch the editing console because they can't keep up with the technology and they don't care about the technology they care, care right. about the cut and the reason for the cut and wh how we're cutting to there and that's everything that's why you're paying them the big bucks is because they have that intuition that they've built through decades of experience that's really interesting actually yeah wow yeah um, i wonder if it's a similar thing in other fields as well Oh, I, I would assume so, you know, um, I would really assume so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I don't think it's just my industry that's that nuanced. But like coming from construction, you know, when we're building, when we're framing a house, we often nicknamed doing carpentry as screwing it up till we got it right. Because, <laughs> yeah, the, the plans say the board should be 12 and a half inches. But when we get it in there, it actually needs to be 12 and... 12 and 3 sixteenths or 12 and uh, 3 eighths and it's about having that experience that knowledge to just go no that's fine it does, it's not going to match exactly what's said we don't have to do exactly what's on the paper we just have to get the right. same result and you learn that nuance over time um, Nina's saying music by the way Nina you're, you're talking like you're a sound editor or a sound engineer or something is, is that about right? Just as we're waiting for this to analyze. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. Uh, measure, measure once, cut twice, and then go buy the new piece of wood. Oh, okay, so <laughs> so this is nothing new to you, Nina. Like uh, Ronald and Jeremy and the and these others can get some info, but you're you know everything I'm going to say already, don't you? <laughs> What really works, uh, Ronald, is, uh, and I've done this plenty, is uh, you tell the new guy, you know, you, 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 make, you make a cut, and you go, gosh darn it, you know, construction language, I'm going to keep it PG here, but construction language, gosh darn it. Uh, hey, newbie, can you go to the truck? I need you to grab something. Yeah, totally. What, what can I grab you? Uh, I just need the board stretcher. Can you go grab that? And make sure it's the left-hand one as well. And uh, they go and they search, and it's hilarious. They will search for 10 minutes, sometimes 15 minutes, because they're scared of being ignorant. 
and then they'll come back tail between their legs until I, I can't find it where where is it and it's like oh don't worry it, it's just it's over there by the elbow grease <laughs> and then they go back and they're looking for the elbow grease to find the left hand board stretcher and then they come back after another five minutes they go I have no clue what you're talking about man where where is this elbow grease and like oh come on man you just you, you walk in the truck you look to your right there's the blinker fluid and then right across from the blinker fluid is the elbow grease and underneath the elbow grease is the board stretcher <laughs> i like the idea of just remaining pleasant throughout though just like oh come on you you can do it yeah yeah <laughs> like and that's the other thing too is when you hear construction workers swear that sometimes they mean it like they're actually angry other times they just it's just the vernacular it's just the language you know i i walk into my wife's family i've got to speak an academic vernacular when i walk into a production environment I'm talking through my workflow and all of our clients are like, are they speaking Greek or Chinese or what is this? <laughs> and then I go and I talk with my friends from construction and mechanical and everything. And, you know, it's all full of F-bombs and swear words and it doesn't, we're not angry. It's just how we talk. Yeah, <laughs> the fair Corona enough. lime extractor. <laughs> I love this. Are you seeing these ones come in here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. It reminds me of that. My, uh, my friend who's in engineering showed me this video that's like an inside joke of like the, uh, what's it called? The retro encabulator. There's like a video of just some oh, guy. Oh, dude. Yes. I love that one. Go it's ahead. It's such a good video. It, it's just, I just recall that it's just like, basically he's just like showing off some new technology. He's just standing in front of like an ancient looking like computer. Mm -hmm. And he's just talking about like, oh yes. And then, you know, using this thing, we can do this thing. But all of the names are made up and what he's saying makes no sense, but it sounds legit. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I have a degree in computers and I was like, what is he talking about? <laughs> nice. And honestly, I don't remember if it actually is a Tim and Eric sketch, but it feels like a Tim and Eric sketch. Does that make sense? I actually, I don't watch Tim and Eric. <laughs> So I, I oh, can't okay. comment on that one. It's just kind of the vibe of like you're watching it and like it's one of those things where it's like I know all the words that you just said like individually, but when you put them together, I have no idea what you just said. Like yeah. what? It's and it, it's just that feeling of confusion that I feel like is their entire brand of comedy. <laughs> okay. Oh, man. Yeah, no, I, I should listen to more comedians in my life. <laughs> I don't get enough. Enough laughs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I need more laughs. It's all serious stuff. I used to laugh at people. You ever do that thing when you're editing video and you figure out that you can scrub and keep the audio going at the same time? And uh, <laughs> and you can kind of make them sound like... And you're doing this back and forth with their lips. Some billionaire <laughs> that, you're, that you did an interview for and you're making them sound like a chipmunks. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a great time. <laughs> Uh, okay, so let's pick on a scene here. Um, by the way, anyone who's in production or video, and this is what it does. So this was all one clip in here. And now if I zoom in, let's zoom into the, like, this section here. It has divided it. Here's one shot. And then there's another shot, another cut, and a cut. And it went and it just divided all that up for me. I actually use this in a live edit situation where I record the the live production and I do my switch then I bring it back home I nest I synchronize everything I nest it and so I just have <clears throat> and I leave it on the one of the tracks in my nest is always my live edit my program output recording and so I switch my multicam in premiere to that program output track and I right click, I do this process and it cuts everywhere that I cut on the day. And that way, if I've got, if I'm honing into certain mistakes or certain edits, I can go in there and I can leverage the multicam selection ability so I can switch cameras. And I also have the cuts right there. So I just have to hit shortcut N, drag that to cut point, call it a day. My edit has been fixed. Mm -hmm. um, it saves me, I've, so far, I've estimated it saves me at least 30% of post-production time in, uh, in the edit. Wow. Which, when you're dealing with 10-hour shows, like 10-hour recording days, no, 14-hour recording days, 10 hours of footage, that counts for a whole lot. That's <laughs> yeah, huge. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so this is a process I've gotten very happy with. But uh, anyways, so Thane. 
go ahead and pick on a spot that strikes your memory. And let's go find it. Uh, there's a scene where they're, like, they're, it's like, um, do you, have, do you know the show very well or no? Um, you mean the animated show or the actual movie here? The animated show. Yeah, I, I know the animated show fairly well. Okay, so you know that episode, actually, it's like, I think it's a little bit after this, basically. Like, it's pretty much the next scene after this one, where they're oh. in, like, a, a camp that's, like, has all these earthbenders in it, and it's where, oh. like, they're... <laughs> Yeah, I know exactly what you're gonna say. You're That's talking the about right the now. one shot. That's literally the shot here. Wait, no, it's yeah. the shot here. Okay, it's a one -er for no conceivable reason. <laughs> well, the thing is, the thing is, earth bend or bending. Like this is the problem with this. First of all, is the oh, where to start? <laughs> 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 oh man, you've opened up a can of worms here. Uh, so. The thing about one shots, there's there's two reasons to do a one shot. The first one is for street cred, and look at me, I'm badass, and I got a one shot, and it works, right. and I'm an awesome director and DP, and that's all there is to it in your face. That's the first reason. The second reason is because it makes sense to help establish your environment and the action. So, mm -hmm. like a classic one shot would be. Um, whether you want to go from big to small or small to big, you take one of those directions. There's, a, there's way, many ways to use this, but it's just one of the great applications where you take a single shot. You're, you're in a one up, you're in a medium like this here. This is like a medium close up um, or a close up, depending on which director you're working with. So you go from a one up like this and you you're in crowded hallways and you're walking through a dingy pub or whatever like you're in a confined environment you're going from a one-up situation and then you it slowly opens up and opens up and opens up and eventually you have your steady cam operator on a cherry picker being raised right or a cable being raised right into the sky on a platform and taking in the whole street there's so many films that right do, it that establishes that thing. scale yeah. right like that is a great use for it. another great use is to keep you know, everything else is happening around the character. The, the world's burning down around the character, but you want to keep on the character the whole time. Well, you do a one-er and they walk through that environment of what's going on and do whatever action they need to do during that. And you keep it on a one-er or a medium, or you can even do a wide, but you're just keeping in the moment with them and you're feeling the same intensity that they're feeling. Like that's another great application for a one-er. But there is a. You ever heard of a every frame of painting? They are freaking amazing. I yeah. So I, there he has a video on uh, the Spielberg Warner, which I thought was really interesting as well. Which was mm -hmm. it doesn't seem to really fit into either of the category. I don't know. Like like the Warner and Jaws, where they're on the boat. Do you know what I'm talking? Like they're on the little like with the mayor. Do you know what I'm talking about? Um. Oh yeah yeah with the turntable bridge. Uh, yeah, yeah yeah exactly. Yeah that one yeah yeah. What about it? It doesn't really seem to fall into either of the categories that you were mentioning. Like, it's not really for establishing scale or anything like that. It just kind of sticks on the two of them having that conversation, right? Yeah, but, but it keeps our attention hooked is the big thing. Right. Like, it's... there. Don't get me wrong. Spielberg is also one of these people who will use a one -er just to say they used a one -er. um, right, Old <laughs> Boy is another one that uses a one -er just to say that they used a one -er, uh, the new one. The old one used it to say that they could do a one-er and they use it to great effect. Um, I love the old, the old boy is so good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my, my roommate showed it to me. And I, it's one of those movies that is like objectively one of the best movies I've ever seen. I don't know if I can ever watch it again though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so that's the thing is one-ers are, I, I should actually simplify it below that. One-ers are great for keeping your attention focused. Mm. Um, you cut when you need to have the attention shifted and that's why there's a big criticism with fight scenes these days how they're overcut is it's like here we'll just throw a bunch of cuts at you you won't have any idea what's going on but right like entertained marvel the whole time fight scene depends on which one because there are some really good marvel fight scenes that are really effective like i really i did enjoy the one-off between stark and captain america um mm. a few films back that one I actually enjoyed because they're using their, I don't know if they overcut it or not, but I liked it because every cut was showing like it was more of an emotional beats cut. Um, actually, another good one for 
knowing when to cut during fight scenes is the Kingsman series. Have you seen those? I have. Oh, I seen the first one anyway. Oh man, like the second one's good. The first one's gold, but the second one's good. Um, but they are great at that because they will use oneers to keep your attention focused. Now they're fake oneers. They're they're there's composites right. they're not actually it wasn't one shot in camera but they're putting them together exactly and they're doing enough tricks that you can kind of call them oneers even though purists might not say that uh, right i remember seeing corridor breaking down that one they the fight scene they did in the car where he's like oh, going around the outside of the car yeah <laughs> well the standout one to me the absolute best standout one is either is um the bar scene manners maketh man in the first movie mm. or the church fight scene in the first movie those are my two favorites oh, like at the so end far. yeah yeah um those two are by far my favorite the close runner-up is the fight between the cowboy dude and our two main characters in the second one near the end that was also in the really diner. good yeah in the diner there yeah those that was also really good but mm -hmm. the first, those two first that I mentioned there, they're faked because it's all what they did is they recorded in a super high resolution sensor. And <laughs> sure thing, Nina. Well, look for all the hidden cuts, Nina, because those things are chock full of cuts. But on the first viewing and even second and third viewing, it's really tough to see those cuts um, because they hide them so well what they did is they used i think they used a super high resolution they used like an 8k sensor or something like that and they still operated it but all those movements like you know those punch in and come out and pan left and all these sorts of things a lot of those exaggerated camera movements were not in camera they did those in post because Ooh. they recorded a high enough resolution in black magic ways that i don't know how to do so <laughs> up front there um, but they prepared their onset experience enough that in post they were able to mess with the angle, mess with the zoom, mess with all this stuff and make it a super dynamic as if the camera operator was dancing with them. But he actually that's kind of what it looks like, especially in the in the church scene. It's like yeah. you're right up behind the guy. Yeah. And so, you know, the camera operator does follow through with a gimbal or whatever stabilization they want to use. Like they're still doing basic movements, but they're holding still a lot more than you think that they are. Um, they're holding still like they're doing basic camera operating like I don't want to call them basic they're way more badass than I could ever be but as far as what they're used to doing this is more of a basic and just keeping in mind the certain points that they have to hit so that the post crew can manipulate that image correctly um, but they're hiding cuts you know someone gets thrown across they, you know someone gets Osoto Gary right off across the screen they use that as a wipe transition that body someone swings a pool cue they'll use that as a wipe transition. Um, and they're just there. It's not that they're using super advanced cuts. It's just that they're being very detail oriented and planning out those beforehand to make sure that they work. But they're being super detail oriented with their keyframing on all those to merge clips together. And it's, it's, it's absolutely insane. It's to be a fly on the wall for, for the filming of these, I, that, yeah, I would probably pay for that experience. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would gladly work PA just to be a fly on the wall there. Fair. I have my phone on mute and it still rang me, so I don't know what's going on with that. I'm actually going to go grab my... Sorry about my alarm. I'm just going to go grab my food out of the oven. Okay, no worries. <laughs> uh, anyway, so yeah, no, I, I'm... I find Kingsman is sort of a satire on the action film industry, which I think is very obvious to everyone who's ever watched it. Um, but I love how they do that satire. They do a very effective job of making it entertaining while also putting it straight in your face as a, uh, this is what you like. You, you like James, like, okay. The internet for some reason went on fire tell me your, uh, your guys thoughts here, but the internet went on fire about the scene, uh, at the end of the first uh, Kingsman movie. The one where he meets the princess and he says, oh, I'll be back later. And then he comes back later and he's this suave guy with the bottle of champagne going into her room. <laughs> that scene, everyone freaked out and called it like super sexist and everything, which is the point. Like anyone who complained about that scene being in the movie 
missed the point of the entire movie. That movie is a criticism on stuff like James Bond, as far as I'm concerned. Like, I, I like James Bond as well. But James Bond is so unrealistic, and it's incredibly sexist, and all this stuff throughout its history, that I see the Kingsman as just taking James Bond as its source material and writing a commentary about it, including the damsel in the bedroom. I thought it was funny. I thought it was like, uh-huh, oh, you, you stuck it to them now. But uh, I guess not everyone thinks the same thing as I do. So, you know, one of these days we'll have a point of view gun from Hitchhiker's Guide and uh, we'll just aim it at the earth. Get me in the shuttle, aim it at the earth, and I'll pull the trigger for everyone. You're welcome. And then everyone will love stout beers as well. Stout and porters and ambers. There won't be any of this IPA or Pilsner or anything. But uh, anyways, <laughs> off on a sidetrack there. Um, so I'm just going to take a look at this scene real quick before Thane comes back here. So kind of... <laughs> I think this is where the Wonner is trying to start. Yeah, we're going to discount that one there. Just going to move it to that track and invisible it. Uh-huh. Um, and actually, to your point earlier... Oh, TSK. Yeah, a, a nice... I, okay, um, I confession, I do also drink caribou beer, which is like crappy, sugary pilsner. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I can't, I can't uh, be on too much of my high horse here. But uh, um, yeah, an IPA... I have a love-hate relationship with IPAs because... Here on the West Coast, everyone's in a big fad of making them as hoppy as possible. Ooh, can you taste the notes of these hops? And it just drives me crazy because if I take my dad, who likes a good beer, and I take him to a, a local brewery and I say, hey, these people make really good beer. I put a glass down on the table and he drinks it. He'll probably put it down and go, it's sour. <laughs> yeah, Ronald, you need to send some over to me. That, that's all that's all it is you need to send some over i can't do a road trip in my tacoma like i can do Montreal here so you're going to miss out on brad and uh, and thanes and you know robbie if he joins us too but i haven't seen him for a while <laughs> well first you stick it in an old wooden barrel guts and all and you uh hope the flies don't get to it that's first step <laughs> <laughs> um but, you know, I can't bring my Tacoma over to Europe, and I don't think it would fit in your streets anyway, so I think you have to come to us, Ronald, and bring some of that nice beer with you. Um, but yeah, no, I just, I like a nice smooth malty beer. Um, on a hot day, I don't mind IPAs and whatnot, but... Uh... See, for me, IPA is more of a winter beer, honestly. Really? Oh, yeah. How I'm... so? I don't know. I mean, like for me, if it's like a super hot day, and I'm te I'm talking like on the beach kind of thing. Yeah. I honestly, my favorite hot day beer is uh like a Qingdao, like or a Qingtao. It's like the Chinese beer. It's like a pale ale or like a pale oh, lager, okay. I think. And it's just ever so sweet, it's slightly sweet, but it's kind of like it's. I don't know. Maybe it's because I grew up around it. Um, because it was like. It's funny, it was, used to be my dad's favorite beer. Everyone in my family drank it. And then my dad, as you mentioned, kind of hopped on the bandwagon. And now he's like, give me your hoppiest beer. Like, oh, that's goodness. <laughs> and I like an IPA, but, I, you know, if they get too hoppy, I'm, I'm whatever about it. I'm not very picky. But I think my favorites are generally, like, IPAs that have a – it's kind of like hot sauces. This is, this is going to sound weird. But, like, <laughs> okay. hot sauces, like, if your hot sauce doesn't have a personality other than being spicy – I don't want it. And oh, I like spicy yeah. food. And the same thing with IPA. I like an IPA that has a personality other than being hoppy. Yeah. Like it's citrusy, a... I'm a fan of. Uh, that kind of stuff, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It's sort of, uh, you mentioned hot sauces, reminds me. I completely, I completely agree with you about that. Um, and to that effect, there's a hot sauce that I have like half a bottle left. And 
it's uh, from Calgary, actually. So, Brad, you might know this place. But it's from a place no longer exists. They've been a different location, or it's a different... Uh, it's a different uh, uh, store altogether in this location now. But it was called the Glory of India. And this hot sauce... You know how a lot of hot sauces, they they uh, push how many Scoble units that they have or whatever? That's um, a hot thing to do right now, yeah. Yeah. And, haha, ha, really. Um, ah. <laughs> I didn't even mean it. <laughs> um, but what this, this place, we went there and it was legitimately hot. You know, like the, you order their hottest dishes and that you see through the cook's doors in the back, they put on a, a, a gas mask or whatever, like a special filter respirator um, and goggles just because of steam and everything would hurt them. And uh, we enjoyed it. It was really tasty. And the dishes that we used to cool down our mouths from the hot ones were the ones that my wife was using as her hot dishes, ironically. But this hot sauce was not designed to be hot. That's a second nature. That's like the, the additional little oops in it. It's a detail. It was actually designed to be tasty first. And it is so tasty. Like, you sit there and your mouth is on fire, but you're not noticing the heat. You, you're noticing the wonderful flavor in your food. It's yeah. that good. And it's like, oh. So what I used to do is when my espresso machine, it, it broke on me a little while back. But I used to make espressos all the time. And... One thing that I would do is I would melt chocolate, like Baker's chocolate, into some butter, and I'd make myself a chocolate, uh, a chocolate, uh, what do you call that? Anyways, like a, it's not a syrup, it's, uh, anyways, I'd melt some chocolate and some butter, and I'd make it uh, very loose, and then I would froth that with the milk and put a drop of this hot sauce, just a single drop, two or three drops, and your mouth would be on fire. One drop in a in a decent sized mug and then i'd froth that all together and i pour the espresso on top and you had like this beautiful mayan hot chocolate or this mayan mocha that's um, so interesting oh it was so tasty did the hot sauce have like a savory like it was a savory flavor to it or was it more sweet uh, it was a savory yeah so yeah you had you had the the heat with this little bit of savory and this beautiful baker's chocolate combined with an espresso and I used a French roast for the espresso I know call me a heretic I didn't use espresso beans I used French roast beans but I found with the crema that I was getting and the flavor I was getting out of it it actually really worked <laughs> yeah just hot for the sake of being hot doesn't do it for me um, I've got three or four different hot sauces in my fridge uh, sriracha is one I go to as my common all the time hot sauce just a bit of garlic a bit of heat tasty but there's one that you can only get in the states called mojara mobera and that one is just freaking tasty it's like it's not sweet but every time in my mind i kind of feel like oh, this is going to sound weird but I, it, my mind makes the connection of like eating a banana like it's that sort of pleasant um conformist sort of taste that just works with almost everything that's interesting wow yeah one of these days i'll have to show you um, actually, one place we've got to go next time I go cross country is we got to go to Toronto and there's a beer place called Say What? Like the French say, like C is apostrophe E-S-T mm. and then what in English. And they've got like 30 different beers on tap, all sourced uniquely for them. <laughs> But anyways, going back to picking on uh, on uh, this poor movie again that everyone's already <laughs> done. Like we are not being original whatsoever here, <laughs> but let's go ahead. So the thing I find with it, what turns me off about it is this is a marsh. This like, let's just get something straight. Anyone who doesn't know Avatar, all the bending is martial arts. Like airbending is like wushu, I think or some derivative uh water bending is uh, tai chi based the earth bending is a korean uh martial art i believe and uh fire bending is oh, wait no fire bending was wushu yeah airbending, yeah sure uh, what... air bending is like i think air bending is um capoeira okay okay yeah 
Um, so these are all martial arts. So doing a big fight scene like this was honestly, this was the most focused a climactic fight scene in the movie, if I remember correctly. Like sure there is there is battle and war and fighting over here somewhere. And this is supposed to be the climactic one. But as far as a focused fight scene, this is sort of like this could have been that fight scene that established the whole film that really stood out. Um, but this is a fight scene. Why are we shooting martial arts in super slow mo? Everyone standing around waiting their turn like this. Even though Ip Man has that, they still keep it interesting, you know, but why are we doing a wonder where everyone's just standing around? Why aren't these guys fighting? Why aren't these guys cracking fire whips? <laughs> the, guy who's, the guy who's standing in the center of that frame there was looking at them like, why are you guys not fighting? <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing is, I think uh, Corridor Digital actually talked about this as well um, with a fight coordinator or a, a stunt coordinator. And it's like the whole everyone needs to be doing something. And there's so much not happening. Like, look, oh, Katara's just going, what the frick are you doing? Why would you hurt my friends? when she could be actively grabbing his arm. And look, there's Aang, and he's just standing there. <laughs> you know, it's like, so that, you know, without tearing it to bits, it's just like, it's so unmotivated. So what if instead of wasting all this time with the transitions, okay, and first of all, just because I'm an Avatar fan a little bit, this is stupid. Can I just point out this, this here, this group movement to move a pebble <laughs> is just the most idiotic thing I've seen all movie. That's the best part of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> that rock must have been like some black hole material or white dwarf material or so something. So heavy, yeah. <laughs> you know? So all these guys are doing the lifting to for this guy to do the punch. Like, that's just, come on, stupid. So anyways, <laughs> let, let's, let's uh, actually cut some stuff out and see what happens. So we stand around, yada yada. There's Momo in the background, which doesn't add anything. We're just standing watching Aang do this. Okay, she pushes. Okay, let's let's just start it from here. Let's go like that, and let's just kabam goodbye. He pushes, boom, cut. Like okay, actually wait one second. Oop, not that. Let's not do that one. There we go. So he pushes here. Now, I would normally want to cut to his action going here, and he would be doing something in this direction. He would cross the frame, which I could then use to motivate a cut. But in this case, he looks, it looks like he's going to do something. Oh, wait, psych, he's not doing anything. Like, that movement, he should have thrust forward with, and the camera operator should have worked with him, in my mind, at least. But instead, he's doing something else. Oh, wait, no, he's changed direction again. Oh, now we're back to a, what's this, a third direction since he changed the first time? Oh, he's, I guess he's building a cyclone or something. Oh, that is super martial arty. You know, they hired this kid because he was a martial artist. And they're not letting him do martial arts. They're making him just wave around. This is, a, this was a break in the wonder. And now all of a sudden we're doing something different. Like we go from, ooh, I'm, I'm doing the wiggle. I'm doing the wiggle to... Now I'm doing something completely different. So what if we went... So let's just get rid of that. Let's just say... Actually, no, let's keep that for a moment. That's a reaction shot. So what if we actually move this, which is... Let's just take that there. No, let's enable that there. Get rid of this. And let's put that in over here. So she gets attacked. He defends her. He's getting ready for something. Let's cut there. Let's throw this over here. Let's just get rid of all the audio. We don't need the audio. No, no. Not what I want to do. Wrong buttons. There we go. Get rid of all the audio. Get rid of all the other audio. Bam, done. So we go from there to here. 
And we skip a lot of this here because this is just useless. Okay, what's going to happen here? So let's skip the beginning part of this. We don't need that. Maybe from here. And when he does that, what happens after here? This is kind of useless. And yeah, he falls out of frame when he's supposed to be like the main character. So whatever. Let's end with So that. if you had to guess between like direction, shooting, editing, like what's the what's the weakest link here? I mean they're all not great, but like what's the weakest link? What I see going on, and keep in mind I have limited feature experience, but what I see going on here is the stunt coordinator and all of the stuntmen are doing their best. Like, they thrive on, here is my moment. I've done my thing. Now I'm out of frame so that the next person can do their moment. Or if it's like a Jackie Chan film, it's like we all have our moments simultaneously. We're just all busy all the time. Like, there's sort of those two that I've seen myself. So I think the coordinator and the stuntmen are all hit, sitting here going, this is stupid. At least I'm getting paid, but this is not making it on my reel. Um, then the director is typically in charge of the vision. They're the ones who were there during storyboarding and writing and everything else. So I think this falls, I think it falls on the director having a vision, but not being swayed, not trusting in his other members. So oftentimes what will happen is, oh, well, the light, you know, they, they go, oh, well, we want the costume to be black on black, for instance. That's a common one. Oh, let's we all wear black costumes in a black environment, in a dark nighttime environment. And now you're sitting there with your lights going, okay, cool, that's fine. Yeah, I'll just boost the light. No, 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 we want it to look moody. Oh, well, how do we get a moody, which means dark, black location or dark location with black clad actors to pop out and be able to see what's going on? So that's when you start seeing like your rim lights being used. That's when you see them use the Rainmaker across the entire location just to add water so that there's reflections so that the lights that are coming down bounce up in a specular way that adds definition to the costuming and to the faces. Um, like often, some oftentimes directors will have a vision and they will just stick to that vision. Um, and you're left there trying to go, okay, how the heck do we make this work? That's what this right. feels like to me is, oh, well, we got to do a one -er. and that's, that's, we got it. We, and it's got to look like this and it's got to, and you're sitting there going, okay, so we want a, a one -er with a semi wide angle, a medium to wide angle, um, with exact choreographed movements. Like everyone, maybe it was also rushed. I don't know, but like I would have these people in the, uh, I'm pointing at my screen. Let me use my mouse instead. Um, <laughs> like these guys here okay, there's kids and that's probably a parent. They're all trying to hide, whatever. What are they going to be doing? Give them something to do. Give these people something to do. Why is he waiting to take the attack? This guy's bending. You got to take that guy out. Like you should be getting in there fast. Um, so on and so forth. So I think it's a vision clash with the practicality of accomplishing that vision. Right. Um, I think he wanted a wonder and this is an action segment with martial arts you should be doing inserts you should be doing cutaways you should be showing the effect the punch and then the follow-through um or if you're going to do a one-er then make sure that everyone is freaking busy all the time just fill that frame with activity easier said than done records and brad easier said than done because <laughs> it reminds me of that uh that scene from the raid 2 the kitchen which is just like the costuming is so perfect because it's just a perfectly white kitchen and they're wearing black and then you see like yeah as they're fighting the kitchen gets dirtier and dirtier <laughs> I, I have seen the clip but i have yet to watch the actual movie but that's exactly like the more there's actually there's a whole science to it as well like you look at uh all the characters from blizzard's games uh, on their new platform so a league of legends and all this sort of stuff and especially uh shoot what's the shooter one 
Overwatch. Each mm-hmm. character, you can tell exactly who each character is from their silhouette. Yeah, true. Like, the more you can have it that clear, um, the better you got it. Yeah, the problem with records is, especially when you're shooting on TV or you're shooting on film and you're using up literally thousands of dollars per hour or per minute, actually. I think on the last show I was on, we were calculating it's about a thousand dollars per minute to make that show <laughs> how many minutes did you spend making that calculation <laughs> um uh, i was the pa for that so i had all the minutes in the world <laughs> ah. i was on locations team but uh the problem is the especially with tv they are so like they have huge budgets but the they have such minuscule budgets compared to film And so when you're doing things to a filmic standard, especially on TV where you find most of these problems, they're trying to do, they're trying to bang out a fight scene at Corridor talks about this quite a bit. And I've seen this myself is, okay, so we have one day to get this fight in the can. Now, one day is not one true day. It's like seven hours and seven hours is not seven hours. It's um, seven hours minus half an hour for lunch, minus your breaks. And then there's all, all the downtime uh, from okay, we gotta move a light, we gotta adjust a camera setting, we gotta change a battery, we gotta. So your seven-hour day, honestly, if you're getting five, not even five, if you're getting like three hours of content or three hours of shooting, however many takes in whatever many scenes, that's an all right day. <laughs> you know, you're hoping to shoot a lot more than that, but depending on what you're shooting, three hours of productive time, three to five hours out of a eight-hour session or eight hour day is acceptable. Yeah, resetting, yeah. You, okay, let's reset, let's change the cloak because it got dusty. Like everyone who's doing this fight here, this is black. Like anyone who's worn black knows how easy black, or how difficult black is to clean. (laughs) So you're either, sorry, you're either um, changing costume or you're getting a big air compressor to blow the dust out or you're going with dirty clothes and just brushing them off and hoping it's good enough (laughs) and then everyone's got to go back to positions and then there's bathroom breaks and then the camera has to go back to where it's going and then you got to re-slate but you're not slating for just one camera on tv shows you're slating and film as well but i'll speak mostly to tv it's where most of my experience is you're doing a a cam b cam c cam sometimes d cam and then sometimes insert cams like uh, hideaway cameras um and so, okay, well, you just slate it. Yeah, well, first you gotta go, gotta go check with the sound guys that your cameras are still gen locked correctly, because that's how we keep everything in sync. We don't go through and do pluralize to synchronize footage in post. We use the gen lock time code. We override the camera's clock with what the sound guy gave us, and it's accurate. It's basically an atomic clock level of accuracy. And so now you've gotta go and make sure that your slate is still gen locked with the. Uh, with the sound guy and all the cameras are good okay good you do that once or twice a day hopefully sometimes more then you have to have each camera with its own slate so each second ac is you go okay let's roll you know the the first ad calls out okay we're ready to go yeah everyone's ready to go okay roll sound that's always first roll sound okay sound rolling okay uh roll camera or they say sound speed they go roll camera Okay, and one, you know, A cam calls out A cam rolling, B cam rolling, C cam rolling. Okay, uh, let's slate. And then the assistants walk in front of the cameras. And A cam usually, on sets that I've been on, it's usually been A cam, then B cam. But then each camera operator frames up on the assistant's slate. And then you'll hear frame. And then, actually, no, you'll hear slate, mark it. And then you'll hear the clap. And then the B cam will say mark it. Same with a third, as many cameras you got. And then those assistants have to clear frame and get somewhere safe where they're not going to make noise and they can do their jobs. And then you've got to get frame again. And then when everyone's got frame, you hear the camera operator saying frame, frame, frame. And then the the AD looks at the director and goes, you know, you're up. And the director goes, okay. And places on your ones and action so now that whole process i said in about 
40 seconds, but that whole process takes three minutes or so. Now, three minutes multiplied across how many takes, um, and that's not even the longest portion of resetting, but even the smallest port of resetting, which is doing the slate, is that long every single time. So when you're on a time budget and you, you just gotta, I've been on shows where you walk on a location, you just gotta slam lights into place and it takes an hour or two to get everything in place. And you got those lights and it's not like photography where you can use your shutter speed to cancel out ambient light. Because on your shut on photography, as some of us know, my ISO affects everything. Uh, so my ISO is adjustable. Uh, that's how sensitive my camera is. My aperture is adjustable, but I need to keep my aperture to the right level for the look of the film that I'm going for. So these guys are out of focus in the background. He's in focus. He's out of focus. So this would probably be like a a T4 or a F5, some odd, 5.6 or F8. Um, maybe, maybe less than that. On probably like an F5.6 or an F7, somewhere in that range on him. And the focus polar is keeping it dialed in on him. Um, so my aperture is limited because my aperture affects my look because it affects what's in focus and what's out of focus and how the light reacts to my sensor. My sensor is adjustable and then my shutter speed is absolutely never adjustable. Never, ever, ever, ever. If I want to have it at the quote filmic standard of uh, that beautiful motion blur that we all got used to 100 years ago and or 50 years ago and have never left since, it needs to be a 180 degrees shutter. Or in photography terms, if you're doing 24 frames per second, it needs to be a 148th of a second shutter. And if you deviate from that, you are getting a different look. So you cannot use that as your adjustment. Your shutter speed has to stay locked. Your aperture has to stay locked to the look that you're trying to do. And your ISO is really your bread and butter of adjusting luminance. Um, unless you're willing to change your depth of field on the lens. So when you put that all in, you know, that light, you have so little control of that light. That's why you have cherry pickers with dual HM HMIs and then a 40 by uh, silks uh, frame hung by a different cherry picker and all this sort of stuff because we have so little control of light in film without all these giant truckloads of accessories compared to with photography i could just turn my shutter speed up oh and these are your bread and butter too um thank you for mentioning that brad and these and these and these variable and these in tv you often just use uh four by five and these on sleds or on trays because they're made to a higher quality, and as soon as you start using a variable ND, you're introducing artifacts into that ND. So, yeah, it's video is extremely limiting. You know, some of you guys who know me from photography community, I am liberated by photography and the fact that I can use strobes and I can use high shutter speeds and I can do whatever I want. <laughs> what I'm used to is walking in with a backpack and a luggage case and a whole cart full of gear to try and get the look that I'm looking for. And thankfully, technology is changing, so it's getting easier. But yeah, no, the video is quite a bit tougher to get a good image out of. Photography is just as tough to get an advanced image out of. But uh, anyways, <laughs> digression. Um, so what I think is going on here is that there was a vision. And it was storyboarded in, and it was planned for and everything. And the stunt coordinator, maybe, maybe they were a yes man. But maybe they were saying, I don't know how I'm going to make that work. And then they got told, just make it work. Okay, well, here is it just working. We got all this empty space. We got all this non-activity. We got all these nonsensical actions. You know, it's not... Polar Pro... Oh, you got the Peter McKinnon version. Is that actually good? The Peter McKinnon version? Like, it's really bloody expensive, and it's also being sold by the hype train of Peter McKinnon's brand. So I'm 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 hesitant on that one. <laughs> For reference, uh, Thane, there. I don't know if you know of Peter McKinnon on YouTube. Uh, I don't think I do. No. Okay. He was actually one of the guys that I started learning some photography from. Um, well, yeah, photography versus video, and. Uh, 
it worked for a little bit, but he's one of these YouTube photographers. Like, he's done some really good work on his own for his own professional clients in the past. But what he shows on YouTube is not really photography, like professional photographer anymore. It's more, hey, I'm a YouTuber who can teach you about photography. And in my mind, it suffers a bit. But uh, the... Uh, where was I going? Yeah, so I just I hit a bit of a ceiling with him, uh, but he's still going mm. strong and it's great. But he's starting to sell affiliated products with certain companies, like the Peter McKinnon edition of them, right. and they they look really good. Like from what I see online, they actually look really good. But the price tag that they come with is quite high, and I'm not sure if it's worth that much or if it's just he's taking one of their original their existing products. And saying, oh, maybe add some branding to it and release it under my name. You right, know? okay. There's like, a classic, like, uh, it's like, um, I don't know if I told you about this. I'm very into custom keyboards myself. And ooh. I, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there is this joke in, like, the keyboard community because this notoriously bad, like, keyboard company that makes, like, you know, because ke mechanical keyboards particularly get advertised at people who play games. And... Mm. Very rarely do the ones being actually advertised are they actually good. Yeah. And so there's this one company that like it's like Raycon. Like they like dumped all their money <laughs> into their marketing. Yeah. And they don't actually have a good product. But they got affiliated with uh, Ninja. And mm. so it's like so it's like the same subpar not good product, but now yeah. it has Ninja's branding on it, so it's like double the price. Nice. I've always uh for a few years now, I've always been looking at getting myself like a mechanical with the cherry brown s switches on them. Because mm. I don't like the click clack and the brown, if I remember correctly, the brown was a bit more muted for the click clack sound, but they still yeah. gave you that punchiness of like the blues. Yeah, it's a sort of, um, that's actually another joke. In the, there's a lot of jokes. Oh, okay. Movie. I'm going to be the butt of this uh, one. <laughs> well, it's just a classic thing. It's not even like I wouldn't fault anyone for it, but it's like, MX Browns are this sort of joke where they exactly what you said. They still have that tactile punchiness, but they're not as loud as the blue ones. And so it's the perfect middle ground. And that's yeah. what they're advertised as. And that's what everyone thinks they are at first. Mm -hmm. And you get one and it's actually just the worst of both worlds. Really? Because it, oh, it's man. just loud enough to be annoying, but it's also the clickiness is not fully there and so it doesn't feel that nice but it's also not smooth enough to be a linear which is the kind of switch that i use which is very quiet so um, what would you recommend like whites or like red uh, and black are similar as far as i understand blacks are just the quiet reds right uh blacks are a little bit heavier oh, um a bit heavier. okay yeah i would recommend either red or black i started with reds okay i don't like um, red because i'll do too many false clicks like for me i want the I want the select. Yeah. Uh, that's super fair. It. So that like I would and that's personally where I was too where I didn't know what I was doing and I got a red uh, a keyboard with reds and then I mm -hmm. kind of had that for a while cuz I couldn't afford to get a new board and I was like, "Oh, cuz I'm living with this." And then I switched to actually Gateron yellows that are way oh. heavier, like a uh, a good few grams heavier and much easier to like control what I'm pressing. I'm not going to fat finger things. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, and they're really most cheap. Most of the time, too. I'm using them for editing for literally what's right in front of me right now. Yeah, that's. I have a friend who actually really he well he's does video editing and he also is in architecture school, oh, okay. which is a uh, really a jack of all trades there. But so he really he built himself his own little macro pad. Um, <laughs> I've looked at doing that. Um, uh, Taryn from Linus Media Group and uh, Tom Scott both have videos about using a software to trick Windows into actually treating a second keyboard like a second unique keyboard instead of a duplicate of the first one. Mm. And I thought about just taking that and making my own 80, 100 and whatever key shortcut I've been. That would be pretty cool. I don't yeah. even think, you might not even need the software for that because there's a, a software you use to program your keyboard. So like oh. to program it to do whatever you want. And so for example, on my keyboard, I, I code a lot. And so I have... A couple keys on my keyboard that are dedicated to cut copy and paste because i cut copy and paste a lot yeah um, um okay and then i can remove things like cap 
Sorry? Does that work across all the keys on your keyboard or is that just- Yeah, any, oh, I yeah. can make any key whatever I want. Dude, can you send me the link for this, uh, the, whatever you're using? Cause that's exactly what I'm looking for. I, I want a second keyboard, sort of a suspended, like think Cypher from Matrix, how he has all the keyboards floating around him. I want yeah. another keyboard tray that I can put out of the way and bring back in that can be hooked up to this main computer of mine and mm -hmm. just whether it's vmix uh, shortcuts or premiere shortcuts or whatever just all my shortcuts in one spot you can even go you could even go crazy with it if you want i mean what i have is where basically you could have for for example let's say you had like a number pad right just like a three by three mm -hmm. and you said right? okay and you got yeah exactly and it's like okay i want the top left one to be con a macro for control s i want the middle top or whatever and those are all of your shortcuts for vmix yeah. Let's say that then you have another set of shortcuts you might want for uh, Premiere. Yeah. You can have one of your buttons dedicated to swapping between modes. So like the top left when it's in vMix mode will do this thing, but if I press the button, it switches into Premiere mode, and now the top left does this thing instead. Okay. And, and, and is get a this lot a more product, out of or is this a way of using just any old cheap number pad? Or? So it's an open source software, so it's free. Okay. But... Only certain keyboards run with it. It's a, it's a, it's the firmware oh, basically. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you get any mechanical keyboard, they will use this software. It's called QMK. QMK. Any mechanical keyboard uses it. But sometimes, I would, if you have a random number pad laying around, I wouldn't count on it being able to run it. You could look it up, but yeah. um, I wouldn't count on it. Okay. Um, but yeah. Yeah, because that's what I'm looking for. Because right now I have to have a number pad on all my keyboards because just functionality. But mm -hmm. I need to be able to use that number pad as a number pad. Then I need to have, you know, if I if I got a number pad like what you're saying, I'd want it to be able to be used as a number pad and then also be used in vMix and then also be used in Premiere and just separate macros each time. Right. Cycle through the modes. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't care if I have to manually cycle through the modes um, or if it's automatic. You know, I'm open to either one, but mm -hmm. just right now like right now i've got one bound to resize frame so if i take this and i just resize it to like a like tiny tiny if i hit one on my number pad well normally it would set it to frame size what is going on with my nope that's not doing what i want it to do okay well everything's breaking on me today but <laughs> normally what i have is this is bound to why is it not bound? Keyboard shortcuts. Let's look up uh, one. Yeah, set to frame size. That's literally what it's bound to. So I'm not sure why it's not working. But uh, that's, I could resize. I could take any clip and hit one. It would bounce to the right frame size. Mm. But now if I'm trying to type something, that shortcut can get in the way and start activating right. stuff. That's what I'm worried about fair enough but yeah i mean if you're interested yeah if you have any interest in picking up uh, a fancy mechanical keyboard i definitely can provide advice because i've i'm i'm in the hobby all the way it was my covid <laughs> thing that i picked up <laughs> yeah. well if you if you have an idea for a just even a number pad like just a mm -hmm. nine or a three by three or a five by five or something like that um that's not the full price of a normal keyboard or of a mechanical keyboard, mm -hmm. but is just the price for the, the smaller one. And it works with this. I would hundred percent love some advice on that. Sure. I'll look I around. That, I would carry that thing around every day. <laughs> what kind of price range would you look for on that? The lowest possible, really. I'm cheap, but well, yeah, I don't, I don't know <laughs> what sort of price range I'm bound by. Like if I say, Oh, Fifty dollars, and you laugh at me and say, "No, no, no! You're doing three hundred dollar minimum." You know, like I oh, just no, don't know no, what no, scope no. we're dealing with. I'm looking at one right now that's forty USD, um, mm. but you might want to replace some of the parts on it. Is the oh, thing. Okay. Um, so you know, a lot of this is uh, the, the part of what I love about it is that you kind of get to switch things around. Oh, I don't like the color of these keycaps. I'm going to get different keycaps. Oh, I don't like how this switch feels. I'm going to get a different switch. Um, but let's see. These are chocolates. These are. Hmm. Hmm. Let's see. Uh, Brad is talking about uh, a Basilisk V2 keyboard. 
Just little Razor. Yeah, there. see, Razor, I've never been a huge fan of their keyboards. Let me look no? at this one. It's, I mean, you know, it's one of those, um, it's not quite as bad as, uh, it's not It's not bad. I wouldn't call it a bad <laughs> keyboard by any means. But I'm trying to find the keyboard right now. Razor Basilisk V2. <laughs> I Poor Brad, don't he see brings it. up a helpful thing, gets roasted. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I'm only seeing a gaming mouse, actually, for Basilisk. Yeah. Um, do you have a link for that, uh, Brad? Because I'm not seeing... Let's look at their website, maybe. They're... Uh... Okay, Huntsman, <laughs> Widow, Sinoza, Analog, Black Widow, more... I've thought about using their Tartarus. Like the... Uh, it's got a numpad built in and then it's got a thumb joystick. <coughs> and, a, and a wrist rest. That thing sounds like it'd be a comfortable ride. Oh, and I was Good. looking at the Orb Weaver years ago. Which one? The Orb Weaver. The Razer Orb Weaver Chroma. Which is basically just a macro pad. Uh, I just sent you a link for <clears throat> a macro pad. Oh, okay. I Oh, I see this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Which the chat? Sent? Oh, in the chat. Oh, okay. Let me look. Like in our Discord or in the... No, in YouTube. Sorry, YouTube. I can do it in Discord. Oh, I don't see it yet. Here, I will... Okay, send it in Discord now. Epo Maker. Epo Maker. This is where I bought my first keyboard from. It's a very good, like, starting out place. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. That looks fun. And then you can... You know, set the uh, use it as a number pad, or you can then map it. For example, you can change what the F keys do, or not a chroma. Ah, okay, that was the mouse. <laughs> the Omata Chroma V2. Well, you know, Ronald, I just didn't want to have to deal with bots, and so I figured if a bot was smart enough to subscribe, then I'd allow it to chat. But <laughs> <laughs> if it could handle that. Yeah, like, you can subscribe and unsubscribe all you want. It's just to keep the bots out, mainly. <laughs> but yes, now you get alerts every time I go live. <laughs> um, but yeah, so definitely I'm on the lookout for a nice control interface. I've gone through, I've used, there's a Logitech one with a scroll wheel and everything that looked kind of cool. Um, Palette Gear got bought up by another company. And they have what looks like an intriguing product now. It's sort of morphed and adapt, adapted. Um, but one that gets me excited is I really would love to get the Resolve Cut uh, panel. They've got a physical cut uh, device that reminds me very much of the old analog days. And I think that's what they're going for. It only really works in their one cut uh, interface, not in any of the others. But... Uh, once you get used to it, it is so bloody fast to use that thing. But anyways, again, like Resolve doesn't really work for my workflow most of the time because most of the time I'm doing these multicam productions in Premiere. But uh, if I ever did short films again, I'd probably get into. Oh, God, Ronald, please don't troll me with that. I beg you, I will buy you beer. <laughs> don't do that to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, anyways, Here's back, a... back oh, to sorry. this sorry. here. Oh, wait. Oh. I was just Ooh. sending you another macro pad. Ooh, hoo, hoo, hoo. what is this? Oh, it's so itty bitty. Is that lights? Oh, wait. But it's only like six. It's kind of like a mini stream deck. That's kind of fun, though. I think the thing about this one is it's it's fewer keys, kind of a smaller thing, but it looks like it's higher quality. Yeah. Okay, so Ronald, actually, I'm going to uh, I'm going to show this for a moment here. Let's open up. Uh... So the difference is, yeah, it it does. Uh, let's open recent. Not that one. Not that one. No. Okay, let's go and open up a project here. So if I am going into into my NAS which is going to take me a moment because I got to actually log into it. Premiere treats a multicam like a normal clip. It treats it like a normal sequence. 
And when it does that, you can go in and you can modify whatever you need to, whether it's audio channels, whether it's synchronization, you can go into that multicam and adjust things left and right. Because sometimes you're using audio sync and audio sync isn't perfect. It's not like Genlock. So you need to move it sometimes a frame or five in one direction or the other direction. And so in Premiere, once I open up this project and show you, I'll show you what it lets you do. Um, let's go and open up. Sure, let's open up a TEDx here. No, that's exports. Let's, do I got one in here? Um, but um, Let's open this up real quick. Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> Let's just set this to in here. Um, so yeah, the big thing is Premiere still treats multicam as a sequence with subsources part of it. So this green bar that you see here actually has a sequence buried inside there. Actually, well, we don't need all that. So let's, uh, let's just offline that. Uh, we don't need that. Let's load all this in. Um, it used to be in Grand View 2021. Okay, so let's go into Okay, we'll offline those. Let's just offline them for the sake of it. So if I go here and I let's see, let's go to sequences, edit sequences. So here we go. I've got a bunch of offline sources right now, but you can kind of see what I'm dealing with here. So this is one clip, but that clip is a multicam clip. You know, I can drag it around. I can do whatever I want with it. I can cut it up and throw it anywhere. But if I go into this clip, you now see that I've got one, two, three, four different video clips buried inside of it. That's how multicam works. That's how da Vinci, da Vinci does it. <laughs> Free education, that's what you've won, Brad. Um, so this means that if, for instance, let's say I get in here and it's like, this is off by a few milliseconds. Like, let's say it's off by three frames. I can literally come in here and grab and move it by three frames, just like that. Let's put it back to where it was. In DaVinci Resolve, you've got to set up a sync bin where you load all of your media, all the cameras, unsorted. It doesn't even let you sort them. If you have them in subfolders in that bin, it will not sync them. Um, whereas for me, if you look here, we are dealing with so much in data that if I go to... Uh, no, not there. Someone screwed up my... Someone screwed up my file system, and I'm a bit annoyed, but... If I go into any of my other projects and I go to media, there's my day. So I've got to go project, media, the date, and then which camera it came from. Because in each camera, I've got 51 gigabytes across 14 clips. Um, and so to keep, if I was just to throw A cam into the same folder that B cam is that, and C cam and vMix project recording, if I was to throw those all into one bin, I wouldn't know one clip from the next. It'd be a big sorting issue, and we couldn't ever go back and refer to them. So I've got to keep them in these folders. But if I load it into Resolve with all these folders, it's not going to recognize that there are files in there. It's just going to look and say there's nothing in here. So I would have to physically put all these clips in the same folder that all these clips are in, all on the top level. And then Resolve would go through and say, oh, we synchronized it for you. 
And based on my past experience, it does a terrible job of synchronizing um, the type of content that we do. Maybe it works fine for if you're doing a short film or something, but we have, um, put it this way. If I go like this, let's load this in. So this is pluralized. This is what I use to synchronize an entire day of footage in one go. And I just grab it and I go like this and I dump it in here. Now it's made a track for A cam, B cam, C cam, and vmix edit. It's going to think through them all and it's going to develop waveforms for it. Now this here, 14 clips, each clip is going to be roughly, let's see how long. Details, each clip is going to be like 23, let's call it 25 minutes to round it up across 14 clips. That is my entire day for one camera. And I've got four sources that I've got to synchronize. And it's all talking and it's all similar sort of sounds. It's not like, okay, and slate. Okay, action. And then you do this unique action. It's all people just talking all day. And Resolved is just, last I checked, terrible at assembling them. And once you, once it does do the sync bin, you load it up and I can't go in and adjust individual cameras anymore. All I can do is select which camera I want. So from a, from a multicam production standpoint, that's quite useless to me because it's just, I need to get in there and adjust stuff. Stuff changes throughout the whole day. Yeah. Well, basically what you would do in here, let me see if I can pull it up quick. I haven't done this in a very long time, not since like version 15 or 12 or something. So maybe they've made some massive improvements, but I, I'd be surprised. Because that's the other issue. That's why, like, even Premiere, we don't trust Premiere to synchronize our footage. We use a dedicated software for it, simply because you're looking at, this is five hours of content, and that's a short day. Uh, when we were doing location work before COVID, we were doing 10 hours of footage a day. So when you have that much footage, Premiere breaks down even. Like, it, it doesn't matter what you use unless you use something dedicated. Oh, yeah. Resolve is actually good. Don't get me wrong. I do like Resolve. I have it on my computer. I use it all the time. I just don't trust it for certain actions. Um, and when you're doing a big feature film, a blockbuster movie, you've got uh, how many people supporting you? You know, I'm when I'm doing the jobs that I'm doing, I'm going there on location by myself. The camera operators meet me there and we load in and we've got two hours to have everything perfect and ready to run. We run, sometimes it's one hour, but most of the time two hours. We set up, we set up our system, we start recording and editing right then and there. Then I come back and it's just little old me back in my edit day here. So efficiency is the name of the game, efficiency and simpl simplicity. Whereas in a feature, you're going for best quality possible under the circumstances. So you don't just have an editor. Like I'm my, I'm my own editor, assistant editor, and second assistant editor in one package. I'm also my own producer <laughs> and in some ways my own director. So when it comes to that, I don't have the ability time-wise or keeping it all in my head-wise to sit down and uh, and do all the minute steps that it would take a full crew to do. And that's the thing is a feature film has a full crew in even in post-production. But okay, so let's do a sync bin, okay? Um, let's see if I can figure out how to do this. So if I throw these in, can I load them? No, I need to put them in here. Change, yeah, load them all in. Okay, and now it got rid of all my folder structure. So that's a great start right there. Okay, what is going on here? Create. Okay, they've definitely changed things on me. 
So let me just work through this with you guys here. Um, <laughs> Okay. Yeah, of course Casey shows up as a first what first person. Um, actually, no, it didn't work fine there. If I go sync bin, what is this person doing beside that person? Like, these are two different talks, and these are two different talks, and these are two different talks. So, let's get over into the edit bay here. Come on, resolve. There we go. So, let's see. Okay, everyone's doing videos, but I'm not going to listen to a video right now. But uh, let's go and select some of these. Um, click attributes, flags, LUT, generate proxy media. Can I go into here? Okay, create new multicam clip. Here we go. Um, we're going to name it test. Frame rate, perfect sync, angle sync, yeah, angle name. Detect clips from the same camera. Yeah, there we go. Let's create. Let's see what it does. Boom. Okay, let's just go here. Now, if I go here. Wow, this has changed a whole lot. How do I load my multi-viewer? Is it a right click? Okay, I'm not doing it that way. <laughs> Let's see what we got. Multicam, there we go. Yeah. Okay, so here we go, Ronald. Um, I'm calling you out. So if this synchronized it, like it said it would, why is angle one of this lady and angle two of this dude side by side? Like, that's my problem. And it's not that there isn't a way to do it. It's that it's a very clunky interface. It's slow for multicam, especially when you load this much in. It's slow, and it's right now it's wrong. Versus if I come over here, now this is synchronizing still, so I would do this, I would export it, it would come into here, and now I can simply go like this, hit play, and I can go oh, angle one, angle three, two, and four, and it just added all of my cuts right there. So that's why I'm still using Premiere as much as I am. Not because I don't like Resolve, because I find it's great for doing simple cuts. I find it's great for doing intentional projects. Um, it's very focused on the filmmaking process. And to that, it does really great. It's got some of the best stabilization out there. And it's got object removal built right in without a even sweating. So it's a great tool, but for a multicam workflow like what I'm dealing with, it's not terribly effective, to put it simply. Um, we'll see. Hello, I'm back. Oh, you're back. Okay. <laughs> Here I am ranting about uh, multicam synchronization. But, uh, 
No, that's one of the reasons why Resolve is not yet mainstream, as far as I'm concerned. It's a good software. It's great for indies. It's great for small TV shows. Um, it's got some great collaboration features there too. But it's not there and playing from... Oh, now you come back, Ronald? <laughs> um, but it's not playing toe-to-toe -to -toe with Premiere, Final Cut, or the A game, which is, I'm told, Avid, although I've never used Avid before. Um, anyways, so that's that's my little rant about Resolve. I love it, but when it comes to multicamming, I just, I can't be bothered at this point. Not until they make some... Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> You're making jokes there, Ronald. I can't be bothered to keep trying it out every single version that it comes out because most of the time their focus is on the fusion panel or the color panel or the the quick edit panel that's sort of where a lot of their effort goes they've got some stuff in the uh fairlight panel which is nice um well they haven't had to do much they bought a fully featured fairlight was the original company name and integrated them as a panel so you know, he can't go too wrong there. But most of the professionals we work with are using Premiere or Avid or whatnot. Yeah, the uh, the remove objects especially, Brad. I think you'll really enjoy that. That's uh, it's a fun thing. It's it's uh, It blew my mind when it came out because before then you had to do a whole After Effects workflow. But now it's just like click, click, done. And as long as you have the license, it, it, you know, it gets it about half the time easily. But yeah, so with this, you know, I going back all the way to this here, I'd start with the fight with this, whatever dialogue or whatnot comes beforehand. But I'd start with this, get a reaction shot, you know, which makes sense because, okay, go get him. Do a bit of a this, but don't drag it out too far. Just enough that you see Sokka coming in here maybe cut it there because this is all useless this is all dead space Ooh, oh my goodness let's, let's get rid of that actually let's close that whole project um, close project there we go and we'll close plural. oh actually I'm gonna leave that running in the background so this is just building waveforms as we talk in the background just keep that in mind um, let's go through here and let's maybe start from here and it's just about removing dead space so from there i'd love to have something to go in between there but we'll leave it for now because he's there boom There we go. And then we skip all of this. Like, look how much travel time there is here. Like, that's that's like a that's a that's a sin in filmmaking, unless it's meant to show something. You gotta get rid of that. Okay, and now we're just gonna stand around. Like, what is Katara doing? And what is he doing? And what is he doing? He just threw a fireball. Line up your next thing. <laughs> They're all actually just standing. <laughs> they're, they're literally all standing there. Then these people aren't even facing these. Like, like no one's paying attention to each other. Oh, and then now it's time to act again. So we'll just skip that out completely. As stupid as this is here. Let's do this. Boom. Okay, and actually we'll drag this out a little bit. Something like that. Uh, okay, yeah, no, heartfelt moment, but we're just not going to continue past that. Something like that. Now the mo motion is moving. The camera's moving right to left. The action is moving left to right. Our eyes are looking here. So we want these guys to be as close to this side of frame as possible. Which they're never going to be. See, this is where it comes in. Like, you can only 
polish it so much in post as well. Right, because you just you try to match that position of the eye, and it's just not working. Yeah. So what I would do is I'd probably split the difference, like sort of call my losses here. <laughs> yeah, Ronald. Uh, it was my first experience of Avatar, and I just I never got around to watching the film because of it. So what I'm doing here is it's not perfect, and it wouldn't be what I delivered to client, but just for a live stream. You know the camera's moving left i can't track the action i can't match the action unless i find another cutaway that I can throw in here but i can at least match the camera moving so it's so you know like it's oh actually you know what we could do we could have a bit of fun uh... so what happens if we go like that I, i'm gonna pick on that piece right there we're gonna do some goofing around. So these guys, first of all, I am going to... Let's mirror them real quick. Um, I don't do this very often, so bear with me as I find the right tool. Video effects. Do, is it under mirror? Yes, it is. Let's throw a mirror on there. Oh wait, no, that is not what I wanted. Never mind. <laughs> I want a flip of some sort. Um, I think it'd still be under distort. Corner pin, magnify, offset, transform. No, it's not one of those. Oh, it might be an obsolete one. Is it flip? Ah, uh, here we go. So horizontal flip is, I think, the one I'm looking for. Boom. Because then our eye is here to there, and it just it flows a bit easier. And then to repair that, we're just going to make them do a funny dance. We're not actually going to... Uh... This is where object removal will be really good, Ronald. <laughs> um... No, of course Premiere doesn't have it. Um, does it have a clone? No. Okay, so if I was doing an After Effects workflow or Resolve workflow, I'd just take that out completely. And let's close the gap here. And, and then I'd cut to where we're not looking there. Get rid of that. So then they're not connected anymore. It's kind of silly. It's mostly just for a cutaway reason. Oh, hell yeah, I'm Ronald. You know, do something like that. It sort of breaks, but you guys get the idea. Because that's an epic moment. Into that, and then... Like this, Aang should already be doing something. You look at him back there. Like, wh what is he? what is he doing? Sokka is doing something, Katara was doing something, but now she's standing still. They're all stopping to watch. So I want to see Aang there. And nice thing is, Sokka is doing action the whole time. We could even cut it there, maybe. Let's see what happens. Boom. Boom. And then this one, it's going to be more of that maybe let's see actually let's just get rid of those dancing dudes in the first place at all <laughs> yeah channel that inner Seth there Get a written camera, you mook. Yeah, that flows a bit better. And what if we did that right when it landed? It doesn't make sense narratively, but it would work for... Boom. For the beats, anyways. 
And let's do this when he's lifting off. It's a bit confusing. Let's see if we can find something else to put that to for a quick cut. Because this is all boring. Oh, what's this? Oh, it's a fade into. Yeah, you see, that's that's the problem. There's just not enough meat on those bones. It's all trying to be style. So that's sort of my problem with a lot of, like, how much more engaging is that crappy, cheap edit where I have nothing to work with? Oh, why is that slow mo? Okay, we're gonna fix that too. One second. Well, you mean the earth coming up there? No, like, look, as soon as they go into, they do a variable frame rate thing. So this is normal speed, see? And then all of a sudden, kaboom, and, and they just dropped it. So they're probably filming this in, like, 60 or 120 at frames per second. Probably, I don't know. But it looks like you go from fast to now, this is like a... Look how slowly everything oh, is. Oh, yeah. I see that guy on the right moving really slow. Yeah, like they, they must have done like a 60 frames or 120 frames per second and then just slowed it down, intending to do so, which is, you know, that's fine. That's not the thing I'm picking on. It's just it drags it out to be a spectacle. So I would do something like boom, cut it there, and then bring it back in there. It's just a tiny little change. Actually, it's Don't no, too much. Let's go. Because we need our eyes to register it. No. Mm. What if I just sped it up instead? Let's take this clip. And right from where... I think there, that's where they did it. And let's adjust the... I bet you they just did a half time. So let's do a 200% and see what happens. Nope, that's a bit much. Let's do 150. There we go. See, that, that, that looks way more natural already. And then we speed up again. Like, that's the thing, is this scene seems to be mostly about... Uh, spectacle but they didn't give us enough to put our feet our teeth into like even that looks slow-mo what if, what if yeah I... that looks way better but it definitely still feels slow so let's uh let's refine it let's do 175. there we go that looks a bit more natural that's all i'm trying to do is get it to look a little bit natural so we go from there And in fact, what we can actually do, like this is the part that I would slow-mo. Um, okay, so let's take this, let's go speed duration. Let's throw it down to 75% or something. Oh wait, one second. Speed duration, 75%, boom, let's close the gap. Like, doesn't that look better already? We're instead, yeah. instead of highlighting the flame as a slow motion, we're going, and kapow! And you get to see the violence of the flame happen. In fact, I'd speed that up a little bit more, maybe 185. Or... Let's go, it's almost uh... like that, um, it's like an animation thing that I've heard before. You, like, build up the anticipation, you slow, and then as soon as the blow comes out, you whoosh! Yeah. Exactly, and it's sort of, it's the build up and the release, so... This should be the build up where we're going, oh no, 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 and then big release. Heck, I would actually say for interest, what we should do is we should throw a speed ramp in there. Um, so let's do this real quick. Stomping Earth out of the ground with his feet to block a flame. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. Um,. So what I'm trying to do. I 
I haven't done this in such a long time. But, uh... Oh, I think I have to do like this first. Nope, nope. Okay, I don't remember how to do this. Can I... Frame hold, yeah, detection. No, that's definitely audio only. Where did that go? Because that's opacity. I want to show clip keyframes. Ah, here we go. So motion, time remapping, speed. Boom, this is what I'm looking for. So what I'm thinking is we want them slow and we want it to speed up right to the slam and then slow down again. Like even that wall going back down can be slower. So we want that. Put another one there, and between these ones, we want it to be from there. We'll give it a bit of a ramp up time. And now we want this. Oh, what? Oh, I see. Oops. Sorry, guys, I'm using this wrong. Here we go. So we want that to slow down somewhere there and we want this to speed up somewhere over here and in the meantime we want this to be bloody fast so what we're doing is he throws his arms and then this needs to go even faster let's reduce it down a bit And right when it, no, not what I wanted to do. There we go. Let's go like that. I hope I'm not boring you there, thing. Oh no, it's all good. I'm actually really quickly. I'm gonna switch my headphone setup. Give me a second here. Sure thing. Okay, that's way too slow. Can you uh, hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you. Nice, okay. There we go, and we'll just get rid of this a little bit here. Extend it out to about there, and we'll let's bring that back up to a hundred percent. Good enough. So, in effect, what I would have probably done in camera. Okay, he does his build up. We get into some slow and kaboom. And then you also have that slowdown at the end where you get to, because this is all fanfare. You, you have no idea what's going on here for the most part. So you build up, you see the action, and then you have time to reset and realize what just happened. And that's sort of the principle that I'm saying. How many percentage faster did I do? No, let's do... Let's... So, it's all in the subtleties, really. Like, I can't really do much <laughs> in post, but this is sort of stuff that I would address as an editor. 
is instead of that one long take, which, you know, we can go like this and zoom out a bit, which starts and goes like this. And we got all this wasted time. Oh, we're watching a kid do a little dance and Katara's doing movements in the background, but she doesn't actually accomplish anything. Like she only does those movements when she's doing her water bending. There's no water. I don't see any water in the air. What is she bending? <laughs> they forgot. <laughs> they forgot. They really forgot. <laughs> or they ran out of budget or something. Or Like, I don't know. I'm not there. I'm not a cinematographer. I'm not a big filmmaker. But to me, there's just so much dead space. Ooh, we're all going to rise up and do what? They're, they're, they're really not going to do anything. <laughs> Like, anyone with a stick could go and take this whole party out. <laughs> that That's the problem, is all these benders and all of these earth... Like, all these benders across the board, Sokka could have taken them all out by himself, the way that they're acting. The choreography is also just, like, weird. Like, that shot you were looking at before it was kind of strange, particularly because the fire was just going at a guy that was just standing there, shielding himself. Like, yeah, just it was, standing there. It wasn't even going Duck towards a threat. Run away! Move! Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, like, that that's what they had in the movie. This is not going to be a masterpiece, but this is what I would do with the content that they gave me. You know? With the big budget resources, could probably do a bit more. But it's about keeping the action going. And just telling that story as fast as possible. It's also just like the bending itself, like everything, it all feels so much slower than in the show. Yeah, it's all... Like in the show, the exchanges happen in an instant and then they talk or they, they yell at each other what they're going to do. But here, yeah. it's yeah. so much more drawn out. I think it's supposed to be this big epic moment and to celebrate it they're trying to do like a one shot or something and uh it just it doesn't work so anyways that's sort of my gripe with avatar like we can take apart some of the other scenes too but that's sort of you know and it's talk and talk and talk like everything is talking in exposition just show just show us that he knows how to bend fire don't tell us that he's a firebender show something anything yeah um, and the amount of times that they run in circles over and over. But from an editing point of view, yeah, there's a lot of shots that just don't make sense. And I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to get the entire first season into a movie. It's like, no, do a part one, part two. Yeah, and Ronald, that is freaking scary that she can bend blood now. That That's... Whew. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't watched Leg uh, the Legend of Korra, but I'm kind of curious oh, as to what they do. Legend of Korra is really good, but it has a lot of issues. Oh, yeah? Like, I think that you could make the argument that, like, Avatar is, like, Avatar The Last Airbender is, like, really, really, really simple concept. There's nothing special going on in the concept. It's a hero's and journey. Yeah, and then the execution is incredible. The character arcs, the development, the performances, everything is just beautiful. Korra, I would say, is more like, okay, so you've got a much, much more interesting setup. Like, I could talk for hours about the setup of Korra. Mm -hmm. All of it's super interesting conceptually. And then the execution is pretty subpar. Aww. And everything feels kind of anticlimactic. And you're like feel there's a lot of missed potential on the conclusions of things but the setup is way more interesting because like ozai terrible villain not a good mm. villain <laughs> like yeah. he's just angry mark hamill like that's it oh. <laughs> but then you've got like cora the the villains are really interesting they've got cool things going on about them and they actually challenge cora in an interesting way you know what i mean yeah oh that's cool yeah, I'll be interested to see what Netflix... I think it's... Net, no, is it Amazon or Netflix just picked it up? Um, Netflix did it. Yeah, I'll be interested to see what they do with it all, but... 
I like the universe. I like the idea. Um, and there's a lot to be said about, like, there's a lot of video essays out there, some of which deal with uh, child soldiers, for instance, and what war does right. to childhood. Um, so I think it's fairly multi-leveled, like the original Avatar. And it's going to be hard to follow up in their shoes, no matter what they do. Yeah. 100%. That's, I think a lot of people complain about Korra because they wanted it to be Avatar Part 2, and it's not. And I appreciate, honestly, people call Korra a failure. I don't know that I'd call it a failure, but I will say that it's the best kind of failure, which is they were ambitious. They tried something different. They didn't stick to safety. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. They were, they were like, you know what, let's try an ambitious new thing, new story. And I appreciate that because I think the worst kind of failure is when they just phone it in. It's boring. Yeah. Well, and and there's something to be said for casting as well, because, for instance, if we go, how is this Iro? How is that Uncle Iro? <laughs> he's not fat, he's not white, he's not balding, and he doesn't have that merry laugh. There's, there's so many issues. There's just a lot. There's a many, it's a many level issue. Like, it's, it's. And I honestly wish they'd gone, if they had gone further from just copying the story and they were like, you know, we're just going to take the same starting point and do something different. I would be fine with that. Oh, yeah. But they're copying the show and doing it poorly. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the thing is, I think that's where mediums can. Uh... <laughs> OK, Ronald, we'll stop trying to polish it. I think part of what's wrong with some of these adaptations is they're not adaptations. They're. And they're not retellings. They're supposed to be one-to-one -one conversions. Yeah. And that's where I find the biggest trouble with. It's like, no, it's yeah, adapt exactly. it to like, a new medium and find the new medium strengths. Yeah. I mean, like, if you were like, you know what? We're going to do Ira differently this time. Because in the show, Ira's, like, so lovable. Everyone loves him. He's incredible. Oh, yeah. If you wanted to do an alternate take on that character, that's fine. But, like... And that story needs to change as a result. Because this Ira is not lovable. He's no. not fun to watch. No, it's they missed out the the uh, the heart of it. But anyways, yeah. we'll we'll leave <laughs> we'll leave this poor thing in the dust. We'll let the we won't resurrect the horsey right now. But uh, yeah, um, now to do we dare take apart my unlovable turd, <laughs> or should we crack open oh, a no. game? <laughs> I'm happy with whatever. Oh. I, am, I, I will admit I'm very curious about this game. Oh, yeah. Well, maybe we might do a game here. What do you guys think online there? All for you. Um, it's a game called Tabs. Here, I'll load it up and we can, if we end up playing it, we end up playing it. If we end up shutting it down and going back to editing, we can do that too. Um, and we can actually get some decent, okay, actually, before we do that, I got to show it. I got to show this. So this is, this is called Pluralize. And this is three cameras plus my edits, my live edits on this track here. If I hit, so it's built all the waveforms, and if I hit synchronize, this is five hours of content. Let's see if it works this time, or if I'm going to show it off and get Murphy's Law. <laughs> Once in a while it has problems, and I've got to tweak things and do things just the way it likes them. But most of the time, I can kind of just get away with doing once. And so the cameras, they are using their internal microphones to record room tone, um, except for one of them. And then my edits are using the lavalier mics. And even if it stopped right here, look how much work it just saved me across the entire day of trying to synchronize. There we go. Getting some final clips in there. Hmm. 
There we go. And then sometimes if there's an audio track that's especially long, it will actually uh, adjust the audio track for drift as well. And there we go. That is five hours of content across four uh, sources completely synchronized. I can just export it as an XML and load it into Premiere and be ready to edit. I feel but, as though there's a certain level to which I'm missing how really useful. I mean, like, I don't have a, a I feel perspective on this, but that's that seems really good. Yeah. Well, the thing is, it used to be that you had to grab each clip individually and line it up by ear or by eye. I see. And when you're dealing with talking people, not action, that's actually a lot more difficult than it sounds. And you're doing that for each camera. And then the audio, if you have a long audio file, it doesn't record at the same frequency, megahertz frequency, uh, or uh, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Anyways, it doesn't record at the same frequency as the cameras do. So you have a drift that develops over, like you won't notice it in a five minute clip, but you'll notice it in an hour or two hour clip. And I so see. now you're taking your rate stretch tool and you are, I'm going to load up Parsec here while we're talking. Um, and you're taking your rate stretch tool to uh, go ahead and try and adjust that audio to match the cameras the whole day long. And your every adjustment you make shrinks everything, and expands everything like an accordion. So no, it's all relative. And it's just a complete annoyance, complete annoyance. Okay, let's go add friend. Let's get you on here. Is this a controller game or a mouse and keyboard game? Mouse and keyboard. Okay. Um, I'm trying to find where the... Because you sent me your code. Should be under the friends tab on the side there, the little people. Yeah, well, I'm trying to find the code that you sent me earlier. Oh, like oh, your username. I can just resend it if you want. Sure. You might have sent it on the other channel. Yeah, Nina, that is freaking awesome because we used to do like one per like an event, a multi-day event per week. And we'd have to do post-production on it and everything. So, uh, yeah, it took a long, long time to even get the sync right. In fact, most of the time we didn't bother with the sync. We would just go through, find our notes where it said there was an error, and then we'd go and we'd source the same, the clip that we wanted to use and synchronize just those two, figure it out, which would often fail automatically, so we'd have to do it manually. Cut to that, use that clip, get rid of that clip after we were done with it. And we'd have to do that the whole way through. So we were constantly digging through bins, trying to find the right clip because video cameras, they split it up into like eight gigabyte chunks. So it's not one continuous long clip. Um, so having a system like this just, yeah, it reduced our post-production time by like 50%. Okay, so I sent you a friend request. Do you see it yet, Thing? Yep, I got it. Awesome. In the meantime, I'm going to boot up tabs. And I might have to use... Does this capture it? Is it going to capture it? Oh, it looks like it's going to. Yep, there it is. Okay, so I'm actually going to see if I can grab the audio out of here. Yeah, yeah, it is a lot of footage to sync, Nina. <laughs> it's every day or every week a new project and uh yeah actually i'm gonna do how can i get to my no i can't get to it okay so no no, no. 
There we go. This is what I want. Sound settings. We want tabs to go to line two. And we're going to import that here. Audio input virtual line two. Okay, so here is the music for it. Let's get rid of that. Go here. Okay, take care, uh, Nina. See you next time. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'll have a schedule or anything, but uh, I'll always tweet it out, and I guess I'll schedule so you guys get an alert. Okay, so. Okay, so I'm going to give you some permissions here. You're going to have mouse and keyboard control. So go ahead and try and join me here. Okay. I will accept this. And I am going to. Which screen do you see right now? Uh, I see the entrance. Okay, you see the game? I'm getting a bit of an echo on myself. Oh, that's oh, because it's probably. Let's see if we can turn off. Oh, you're hearing the echo on the uh, game. How's that? Hello. Yeah. Test test. No, I still hear myself. Oh. You're pro Are you listening on YouTube or something? Uh, I am, but it's muted. Hmm. Okay, oh. Well. Huh, troubleshooting time. Um, let's <laughs> see. What are we dealing with here? I have you muted to yourself on the call. Oh, wait, hold on. No, yeah, it's it's coming through Parsec. I can hear myself through Parsec. Oh, okay, then just mute Parsec real quick. Uh, then I cannot hear the... Oh, I'll patch it to uh, you through the, through the VMix call. Okay, that works. So there you go. Can you hear it properly now? No. You can't hear the game? Uh, oh, maybe very quietly. Yeah, it's quiet music right now. Yeah, I can hear it. Awesome. And I'll actually, I'll cut out the music. There we go. Okay, so... Here we go, let's do sandbox. And we're gonna do something really, really simple. And you haven't seen this game before, have you? No, I have not. Okay, this is completely a drunken game. So what happens, there's a game that I, a sub game that I like to play. Um, I'll turn the music down a bit. So do you want red or do you want blue? I'll take blue. Okay, so I'll take red. And this whole game, there are tabs of dudes that you can use. And they each have a value to them. And they each do their own unique thing. So, for instance, you've got your basic clubman down here. Um, you've got a spear thrower. Uh, here's a monk. There's a huacha. So you get all sorts of stuff like that. And the whole point is you're trying to, you're trying to defeat each other. That's it. It runs on ragdoll physics and randomized damage. Yeah, go ahead and explore there. Oh yeah, sorry, I'm just looking oh, at Oh, no the... worries, go ahead. Um, and each unit, it's more about knowing what the units do and where to place them. Because you have no control. Once we hit start, you have no control over the units. You can only place them in what makes like good sense. And then hope that it works. And it's a simulation every time. So I see these numbers. Is this like money? Yeah, that's the value. So if you put one of those down, you'll see your value up top, your score, uh, go up. So now you see that's 4,500 uh, points. I was hoping to be a real dragon. Yeah. So what I like and to so do... And so is it about having a lower score and winning? 
No. Um, so what we can do, uh, let's, let's just, let's do a round that's just for fun. I'll take the mouse here. Let's do a round that's just for fun. Um, and then I'll tell you a game that I like to play with this. So let's do, you know, we can, we can do something like just have some hop. I'll put some hop lights down. That's 1800 points worth. And then I will throw some archers in behind or on the side. So yeah, just throw some dudes down around the same value. This one's just okay. for jokes. Um... How do I, uh, nope, that's not what I want to do. Okay. How do I, yeah. oh, oh I WSD. Ah, I see. Yeah. God, got it, got it. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I'll do some spear throwers and then some protectors in front of that. Okay. And then, uh, Catapult back here, and then a bard. What does a bard do? Uh, you'll find out. I'll just have one bard. Okay. And I can probably put around 400 more, so... Hmm. Two bomb throwers. Sure. One bomb thrower. <laughs> oh, yeah, go oh, ahead. Man. All right, that's Good it. Enough. Okay, and then now we just hit go. And we let them have at it. Oh no. <laughs> and we can run the simulation multiple times and it will have different results slightly every time. Just because oh, it's completely man. a simulation. Oh, no, my guys. Uh -oh. My guys. Your guys? Look at my guys. <laughs> I'm down to two. two. My bard is just running at them <laughs> playing music. <laughs> oh. And there we it's go. Like, it's like it's me. Yeah. So you see, that's how the game plays. Um, so I have a game that I learned called Horse. And basically choose a faction that you want to live with. <laughs> Just keep it simple. And we'll start and we'll do 2,000 points at a time. And mm. uh, so I can go first because that will give you an advantage just because you're the new person. And I think I'm going to choose the ancient faction. Um, you can choose the same faction if you want. You can choose a different one. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to put shield bearers up here so there's my first 1100 points then i'm going to put snake archers back here actually let's clear those ones let's put them right behind there we go okay and you go ahead so choose okay, a faction so and you got to live with it for the rest of the time I want Wild West. <laughs> okay, go for it. <laughs> uh, so, Cactus. So, I'm going to put th three cacti. I'm assuming those are close range, right? Is You'll that a fair out. assumption? Okay. I'll do some <laughs> dynamite throwers that are hiding behind that. And then I'll do two mi miners I assume are close range <laughs> and then I have room for one more dynamite thrower that I'll put back there awesome and we're both at exactly 2,000 points okay well let's uh let's see how this goes oh god I really hope that I picked the right guys <laughs> okay well, the cactus Whoa. guys are really strong. Uh, they're really tanky, and they do damage to anyone who hits them. Oh, that's 
the miner doing? Oh, he's just smacking them with his pickaxe. Yep, giant pickaxe. Yeah, I am losing this one. Oh goodness. <laughs> yeah, I am getting mauled. <laughs> Okay. I was wondering why the cat die were so expensive. Oh, they are very useful. Okay, so loser goes second. Okay, so I go first here. Yeah, so go ahead and add another 2,000 points. You can always go under. These are cumulative points. You can always go under, but uh, don't go over. What is this? Oh, okay. Okay. Oh boy, so you got a calf and you got oh boy, oh boy. Um <laughs> I think that I'm going to have to I've only got 2000 points. <laughs> Gazing at the Zeus. Yeah, I think I'm going to do a Zeus back here. You ready? Yeah, do it. <laughs> okay. Does he just hurl lightning? I bet that's what it is. Yes. So your gunslinger does artillery, and you've wiped out my front line. Zeus has missed twice. Three or four, four times. times. Now. Come on, Zeus, pull your weight. <laughs> oh, he took down the cavalry. Oh, he's dead. He's so dead. <laughs> Oh no. What is that coming down from that? Is that the gunslinger coming down? That's like, the that's gunslinger. Like... He shoots it up Wily e. Coyote style. Oh, so you should put him in the back lines, basically, is what I'm hearing. Yeah, yeah he's your artillery. Okay. I see. Okay, I lost, so go ahead and add another 2,000 points. Okay, where is. That's Pirate, Wild West. I'm curious about Lasso. What is that? Oh, that... no, that was that. Okay, yeah, that's mm -hmm. Dead Eye. Is that what I already had? No, I... You yeah, had quick that. draw. Actually, no, you had uh, Gunslinger already. Okay. A gunslinger? Oh, that's coming from the... From above. Got it, got it, got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... I want to put a quick draw over there. And then... Oh, boy. This is going to be rough. Last. <laughs> no, 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 no. Actually, I want to put a move up here. Freaking lost twice so far to a newbie. <laughs> All right, that's it for me. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's go back to the ancients. Well, no wonder we're losing. We're using ancients versus, you know. Yeah, exactly. That, that's exactly yeah. what's going on. Go for another Zeus. It worked so well for you last time. Uh, <laughs> you know what? Have some fun with some Sarissas. So do they work well against the horses then? Yeah. They good. should anyways. We'll see. And I'm just going to go like one, two, three, four, five. Oh, too much. Oh, there we go. 59.20. Okay, I have to go with that. You good? All right. Okay. I think so. Okay, let's get down here. Let's see what this does with the horse. Oh, they dodged. Just, just dodged. They dodged. <laughs> Oh, the horses are both alive somehow. How, They're going how, at Zeus. What, how? How? <laughs> how can he miss so many times? <laughs> I'll butcher? have fun, Ronald. Take care and see you next time. Well, maybe we'll do. Maybe we'll actually edit my video next time instead of <laughs> tearing apart a uh, freaking avatar. Poor old avatar. <laughs> Uh, All right, so that's me then. Yep. Uh, you know, I'm gonna invest in a gunslinger, more gunslingers, because they're really good. I like them a lot. They're really good. I need to find a counter to you. I don't know what to do. Okay. 
Okay, um, let's see what I can do here. <sighs> let's take some more Sarissas in here. Cover up that hole that the horse has charged through. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good to have you, Brad. Good to have All you. Right. Let me know what you think later. <laughs> okay, and with 900, this is for giggles. Ah, oh, frick. 20 over. Um, you can move, remove a Sarissa. No. Never. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, there we go. Let's do this. Oh boy. Okay, the horse oh, went down, horses, both of them. My horses are down immediately. Good. That's more like it. Now my Zeus is not so distracted by moving targets. Oh no. No, my cacti. <laughs> no. And also, my archers are spawns. Uh, oh, like the snakes? Yeah, yeah, they're my summons. Oh no. Come on, shoot that Zeus. Oh, and friendly fire is a thing in this game. Ah, uh, that's good to know. <laughs> maybe my... maybe I should remove the dynamite throwers from right behind my cacti. Well, it's working. Well, no, 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 you can't delete. You can't delete. Oh, I can't delete? That's not allowed? Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I was thinking of introducing more rules as we went, but yeah, no. <laughs> Fair enough. Oh, did I still but win? But you still win. You still freaking win. That's incredible. Incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Where, what happened to my ballista? I had a ballista. Oh no, you removed it because it was too much. Oh right, okay, never mind. So, Mr. Winner. Jeez, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, okay. So typically in a yeah. yeah, in a full game of this or in a normal game of this, we would play until one of us can spell the word horse with our losses, and uh, we would advance. You know, it'd be this whole trade-off. Whoever wins places next and yeah. if you let if you lose twice in a row then we would allow a reset i see um so it's sort of like that and then whoever spells horse first with their losses you know that's end of game you can try again got it so do you want to restart and try that no 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 if you want i don't know i'm having fun anyways i'm happy with whatever i'd okay. probably go for like use us to learn the game a little bit more and have fun but maybe next time that we play, we'll do a horse. Uh, <laughs> okay. No, it's 400. What if I just... <laughs> Bring in some escorts. Ooh. No, too much. Just... Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the snakes seemed to work. Um, try to remember if Zeus went down. How fast Zeus went down? As soon as he was, seemed like as as long as he didn't go down, you would have won. Like it was like he lasted a pretty long time. Yeah. Um, only two thousand. You know what? In for a penny, in for a pound. Except I'm gonna put these guys here. Um, actually. What if I put these guys over here? God dang it. I can only do four there. Um, let's see. And let's stick another Sarissa in here. Oh, come on. No, no, that's gotta be it. That's gotta be it. All right. Here we go. Let's see what happens. You know, go my down. plan with the miners did not work. <gasps> my horses down the middle was a perfect idea. Oh, frick. Oh, no, I'm screwed. Three surviving horses. Yeah, I, I'm just so screwed. Oh, yeah, you see what they do? They grab people and they drag them around. Mm-hmm. And then they're just smiling on top of them. Yeah. Oh, I am so dead. <laughs> okay, I think you got the hang of this game. Let's do some horse. Yeah, we can reset. Okay, so what this is, is we will, whoever wins the last round,
goes first next time. Mm -hmm. And if you lose twice in a row, you get to reset after the winner sets their pieces. I see. Okay. Yeah. You can so totally. I guess I'll go first. Sure, if you want. Um, you can totally not use up all of your points, but uh, yeah, because it only counts the cap. But you know, just try not to cheese it too hard. What's it's two thousand still? Um, yeah, let's stick with two thousand for now. Cool. Um, so I'm switching to Dynasty. Oh boy, you'll um, have fun. <laughs> 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 okay, that'll do. Okay, so you went with Dynasty. I think I'm going to go with either Renaissance or Pirate. Mm -hmm. Maybe Renaissance. These guys are fun. Da Vinci Tank. <laughs> yes, it is that. So what's the name of it? It's T. What's the TA? I'm assuming BS is Battle Simulator. Yeah, a totally accurate Battle Simulator. Aha. Which is actually a lie. <laughs> you think? <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah, I'll add that to my wish list. This is very fun. <laughs> there we go. Ready? Oh, just Musketeer. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm probably going to lose this one. Just saying. But I'm hoping the long game pays off. What? They can deflect bullets now? That's no fair. Oh my. Oh, that... Last I played this, they couldn't deflect bullets. So, I... Was it the ninjas deflecting bullets? No, it's the samurai. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay, in your hands now. Muskets were okay. such a bad investment. Oh, frick. I'm just gonna go for the monkey king. I don't know what he <laughs> does, but I'm really curious. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, go back to... Oop, no, 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 no. No two Monkey Kings. <laughs> um, okay, well. Um... Painters? Yeah. Painters are a thing. Just a horde of painters in front. <laughs> do a little something like that. And then we'll do... Ooh, I need a thousand for that. Oh wait, that's 3,700, so that's okay. Um, and I've got 250 left. Bit of breadcrumbs this way. There we go. You ready? Yep. <laughs> okay. Oh no. My dragon! No! <laughs> Wait, where's my monkey king? I don't even know where he right is. There. Oh, there he is. Oh, He's there, there he is. And there. Oh, and he, there. oh, he teleports. No, he multiplies. Oh. His, this is not looking good. His additional units um, don't last very long, but uh, yeah, no, they he multiplies as soon as he's in combat. I see. Whoa! Yeah. Just my one samurai. No, Monkey King, no! Oh, oh. Oh, there's a dude over here. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. Oh, okay, so no. we both have an H now. Okay. And I'll go first. And you know what? I like balloon archers. What do balloon archers do? They shoot balloons. <laughs> you know what? I'll, I'll give you that. 
Um, and let's throw another Jouster in there. Let's throw him, like, right off to the side to confuse everything. Okay, your go. So I'm going to do... Oh, shoot. <laughs> oh, no. This. And then I'm going to do... That's it. All right. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, that ninja got all the balloons over there. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh wait, where'd the ninja go? Oh, the ninja's there. Those samurai are super helpful for you right now. Yeah. It used to be that they, they uh, didn't block bullets, but now that they do, they're just OP. Against ranged. Oh, oh shit. there goes the Monkey King. Monkey King's in my back line. Oh frick. Oh, <laughs> the, the dragon. dragon, the dragon. <laughs> <laughs> like, what the heck? The thing with balloon archers is they don't. They're more of a control unit. <laughs> so I am officially a hoe. That's true. That's yeah. true. <laughs> yeah. H.O. Um, so yeah, your go first. Oh, right, right, right. Uh, okay, so... The dragon's huge. The dragon's really good. Um, what is that? Is that... I can't see what it says. It says a Huacha. What is that? I'm well, just put it down and take a look. Bit. Ah, uh -huh. okay. <laughs> so I'm gonna go here okay. and then i have 500 remaining i think i'm just gonna pepper my front line with some more of these guys okay okay um renaissance so the jousters are really good at screwing you up um i just need more of them that's true they really do they really do screw me up although i'm just gonna go like this Oh, no. <laughs> Hopefully my dragon can do something about that. <laughs> oh, the, he will. He will, that's for sure. These are partially sacrificial. Okay, I'm ready. You ready? Yeah, go in. Oh, okay. The Hoyacha is pretty good then. Oh, oh there goes my Hoyacha. dragon. As long as you can hit, the Hoyacha is amazing. Come on, come on, <laughs> come on, do something now! What are you aiming at? The guy's coming at him. Oh, there he goes. <laughs> but you still have your monkey. Oh, never mind. Wow, you absolutely destroyed me. All right. It's about time. <laughs> <laughs> and now I am just going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10 and a painter right about there okay your go <laughs> so i think that i need let's see what is that is that a monk is yeah that... yeah that's a monk okay so It's about a thousand, and then round out that thousand, and then I'm gonna put a ninja here, and then that's it. Okay. Nice. Okay, let's see what happens. Let's slow this down so we can see what's going on. <laughs> Okay. 
So the fortune dragon handles that middle pretty well. Yeah, but they take down my dragon. I feel like I need to put more guarding my dragon. Mm. I just love the balloons because everyone goes floating up and then they fall down. <laughs> like, there he goes. <laughs> oh, God. Destroying my guys. It's just my monkey king left. Which is already a powerful force, but... I'm not not sure against all these musketeers. I don't think it is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So does that mean I get to reset? Yeah, I guess you are a whore now. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, so I will. <laughs> I get to reset. But I will put my then... units down first. Oh yeah. Okay, yeah. Good. Just that way, you know what you're resetting against. And for this, I am actually going to. No. Uh beef out my muskets a bit. Um, yeah, that's good. Have fun. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> okay. Do I have to stay in Dynasty or can I go somewhere else? Uh, probably stay in Dynasty. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, do whatever you want. Now you have 12,000 points to play with. Yeah. So you can afford as many of the more expensive ones as you want, or reconfigure everything. Feel free to move around the map if you need to as well. Yeah. Yeah. Actually. Uh, yeah. Okay. Try that. <laughs> Okay. You happy with that? Yeah, I think oh. so. Okay, let's see what happens. Oh, come on, get the horses, yeah, get the horses! Oh, oh, the Monkey King's in full force up there. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, get the dragon in there too, get the dragon! Oh, you just killed a bunch of your own samurai. Oh, that's fine. It's fine! <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay, the dragon's yeah, made it to the back you're, lines. You're gonna get this one. You are definitely getting yeah. this one. There you go. So, pair of whores we are. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> So, let's see what you put down. Oh, right, sorry. I keep forgetting that I go first. <laughs> no worries. Um... beef this up I think that just really overwhelming the numbers was good and then definitely <laughs> the archers were huge yeah when you do it right archers are OP in this game but there's so okay. many ways to cut them from behind yeah okay so that went Terribly for me. <laughs> so what I'm going to seek to do, because once once I have a footing, these guys take care of most of everyone. So what I really want to do is I want to add chaos. Right. So here's chaos number one and chaos number two. Okay. Let's see what happens. Oh boy. As my GPU just struggles. 
I've got a 30-60 as well, but... Oh, wow. Um, I am dealing with... You're doing, uh, you're doing a lot of things at once, though. Yeah, I am doing the live stream at the same time. I don't know how my dragon has gone this far unguarded. I, I have I think, no idea. I think, yeah, there he goes. Oh, I still have quite a few archers left. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're winning this one. The fireworks are really funny. <laughs> cool. Oh, wow. All righty. Okay, I am definitely resetting. Because I'm so on my last life. I'm a yeah. whores all by myself. Oh, where'd my mouse go? There it is. Um, did we place a horse by accident? No? Okay. Uh, yeah, right here. Yeah, That's right there. Here. Okay, so getting rid of that. Um, Actually, no, you go first. <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, okay. Uh, I'm going to invest in another More dragon. dragon <laughs> and then just defend the heck out of them. Okay, well, back to the Renaissance Goai. <sighs> I don't know. I kind of just feel like going like... Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> <The balloon archers. laughs> you know, and just, just do... Uh, what are we at? 16,000 now? 16, yeah. Like, just this could do go that. so poorly for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, you would actually win that one, to be honest. That would just be for a that would be a meme one. But if I did that many rifles, oh boy! Just an uh, actually, you know how you do it. You know how you do it. You do this. You go. If you're doing now, you are optimized against range. So this might work very poorly for me. We'll see. All right. <laughs> okay, I'm going to slow it down for the sake of my computer here. <laughs> they all shoot. And they all deflect. Ooh. See, like you are so optimized against range. Oh, that's not I even have funny. The the Huacha, that's just perfect. If you're all guys are all in one spot, which is the worst case scenario for this. Yeah. Oh, I just killed a bunch of my guys. Well, that's fine. <laughs> but yeah, like look at your dead. And look at my dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you're there super optimized go. against range. There we go. Although I have some Hilarious things to show you. What if you're was he shooting at over there? Yeah, sure. Know. So, given that I've already lost and I'm a horse, I I would love to show you how these things work. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> how much do they cost? Four thousand. Four thousand? Oh yeah. my goodness! Are those bombs? What is that? No, those are just cannonballs. Oh my goodness. So these will also you... lose because it's not that's the thing is there's no one strongest unit. Right. So you know like that will lose, but it's just for ridiculousness. Um now we can go into secret. And I can get a mace spinner. And I can get some cheerleaders. What do the cheerleaders do? They amp up your dude. I see. So if we do that and we do that. And this is where I say it's a drunken game. And it just gets more ridiculous the more you drink. Mm. <laughs> okay, oh, come, on, come, on, come, on, come on, come on. Let's see if they survive. Nope, they didn't survive long enough to get to it. Dang it. Were they trying to get to the dragon? No, I'm trying to. There's a special thing that happens when you surround one mace spinner with a ton of that yes oh that. my oh oh 
he turns into a literal cyclone. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> like, you'll probably still win this, but I just wanted to show off some of the ridiculous things he can do. <laughs> he spun himself right into the dragon's breath. Yeah. And last but not least, there are things in this game. Ice giant. Like this. Oh no. Samurai giant. Mm hmm. Um. And you know what? I'll, I'll back him. I'll back him up with a crap ton of raptors. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> There we go. That's 16,000. All right, here we go. Oh, he breathes ice. Yes. <laughs> oh, there go my dragons. So, yeah, this is... Well, the Monkey King's on the ice giant. Oh, nice. Come on, Monkey King. There. Come on, Monkey King. Oh, your one raptor on my back lines is wreaking havoc. <laughs> Whoa! Oh, there's, there, that monkey king is really stacking against the ice giant. But nope, there he anymore. goes. So that's what it would have taken to beat you. <laughs> <laughs> An ice giant and like 50 raptors. Yeah. So the cheerleader, if you get to play with secret units, the cheerleader is insane. Because he can do stuff like this. Uh, for instance. Go like that. And then you go and you grab the cheerleader. And I don't even need 16,000. But now I've got a minigun. Oh my god. Oh no! <laughs> Which means I'm still going to lose because there's just too many. What is happening to my... What was happening to my dragon there? <laughs> oh, I think he had lost some of his members. <laughs> but, okay, let's say we swapped the... Uh, the ballista and instead we threw a watcha in there oh no oh! they're putting up a valiant effort <laughs> oh my god oh but That's i'm down insane. anyways well they're and, very delicate <laughs> yeah and the cheerleaders will literally explode themselves if they cheer each other too hard <laughs> so anyways so that's tabs for you it is the, wow. one of the ultimate drinking video games out there how much did you get it for i think 20 bucks or something wow wow <laughs> incredible oh man fancy another round or shall we close it up for today yeah i think i might get going to go eat some uh food i'm hungry yeah. again it's a pretty good <laughs> idea <laughs> let's escape out of here my stomach thank is you doing for having me on. Oh, thanks for uh, being around and being available for me to bounce off of, too. Yeah, no problem. But, uh, All right. Yeah, well, I, I don't know I'll when I'm going to do this next, but it'll probably be weekends. Okay. Um, but anytime that you feel like coming on, then you're definitely welcome. Thanks. All right, well, let me know. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> sure thing. Take care. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Okay, and with that, I think I'm going to leave as well. I haven't eaten since breakfast, and it is now like 3 o'clock for me, so I'm going to leave. Anyone who's still here, thanks for watching. Anyone who sees this later, thanks for watching. Sorry for the fuster cluck of uh, attention spans, but that was what today was about. Just getting things up and running, seeing how it works, running into issues, and fixing them on the fly. Next time, I will probably come back with a more polished theme and a more polished workflow, and I will see you then. Thank you, and have yourself a great morning, afternoon, evening, or night.